PySpark is a Python API for Apache Spark, an open source distributed computing framework for big data processing. PySpark provides a simple and efficient way for developers to perform complex data processing and analysis tasks using the Spark's powerful engine. Hi everyone, we welcome you all to this PySpark full course. Today, we have an exciting agenda lined up for you. But before we get started, if you like our videos, then please do not forget to subscribe to our Edureka's YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated with all the latest trending technologies. And also, if you are interested in our PySpark certification training, then please check out the link given in the description box. Now, without any delay, let us go through the agenda. First, we will start by understanding what is Apache Spark. Next, we will explore all about the Apache Spark's architecture. Followed by, we will also look into some of the strategies for how to become a Spark developer. We'll then see the introduction to Apache Spark with Python. Then, let us have some practical experiences. For that, we will start by installing PySpark. And then, we will move on to the PySpark RDD. And we will also learn about the PySpark data frames. After that, we will dive into some of the popular PySpark programming, which covers the PySpark SQL and PySpark streaming. Up next, we will look into the PySpark MLLib, and then we have PySpark training. And finally, we will end up the session by looking into the Spark interview question and answers. By the end of this full course, you will have a plenty of opportunities for hands-on practices and you will have a solid understanding of PySpark and be well prepared to work with the Spark in the professional setting. So let us get started with our first topic, that is what is Apache Spark? What is Spark? Spark is an open source, scalable, massively parallel in-memory execution environment for running analytics applications. You can just think of it as an in-memory layer that sits above the multiple data stores where data can be loaded into the memory and analyzed in parallel across a cluster. Coming to big data processing, much like MapReduce, Spark works to distribute the data across the cluster and then process that data in parallel. The difference here is that Unlike MapReduce, which shuffles the files around the disk, Spark works in memory and that makes it much faster at processing the data than MapReduce. It is also said to be the lightning fast unified analytics engine for big data and machine learning. So now, let's look at the interesting features of Apache Spark. Coming to speed, you can call Spark as a swift processing framework. Why? Because it is 100 times faster in memory and 10 times faster on the disk on comparing it with Hadoop. Not only that, it also provides high data processing speed. Next, powerful caching. It has a simple programming layer that provides powerful caching and disk persistence capabilities. And Spark can be deployed through Mesos, Hadoop via YAN, or Spark's own cluster manager. As you all know that Spark itself was designed and developed for real-time data processing, so it's an obvious fact that it offers real-time computation and low latency because of in-memory computations. Next, Polyglot. Spark provides high-level APIs in Java, Scala, Python, and R. Spark code can be written in any of these four languages. Not only that, it also provides a shell in Scala and Python. So these are the various features of Spark. Now, let's see the various components of Spark ecosystem. Let me first tell you about the Spark core component. It is the most vital component of Spark ecosystem, which is responsible for basic I.O. functions, scheduling, monitoring, etc. The entire Apache Spark ecosystem is built on the top of this core execution engine, which has extensible APIs in different languages like Scala, Python, R, and Java. As I have already mentioned that Spark can be deployed through Mesos, Hadoop via YAN, or Spark's own cluster manager. The Spark ecosystem library is composed of various components like Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, Machine Learning Library. Now, let me explain you each of them. The Spark SQL component is used to leverage the power of declarative queries and optimize storage by executing SQL-like queries on Spark data, which is present in the RDDs and other external sources. Next, 
Spark streaming component allows developers to perform batch processing and streaming of data in the same application. And coming to machine learning library, it eases the deployment and development of scalable machine learning pipelines like summary statistics, correlations, feature extraction, transformation functions, optimization algorithms, etc. And GraphX component lets the data scientists to work with graph and non-graph sources to achieve flexibility and resilience in graph construction and transformation. And now talking about the programming languages, Spark supports Scala. It is a functional programming language in which the Spark is written. So Spark supports Scala as an interface. Then Spark also supports Python interface. You can write the program in Python and execute it over the Spark. Again, if you see the code in Python and Scala, both are very similar. Then R is very famous for data analysis and machine learning. So Spark has also added the support for R and it also supports Java. So you can go ahead and write the code in Java and execute it over the Spark. Next, the data can be stored in HDFS, local file system, Amazon S3 Cloud, and it also supports SQL and NoSQL database as well. So this is all about the various components of Spark ecosystem. Now let's see what's next when it comes to iterative distributed computing that is processing the data over multiple jobs and computations we need to reuse or share the data among multiple jobs in earlier frameworks like Hadoop there were problems while dealing with multiple operations or jobs here we need to store the data in some intermediate stable distributed storage such as HDFS and multiple IO operations makes the overall computations of jobs much slower and they were replications and serializations which in turn made the process even more slower and our goal here was to reduce the number of IO operations through HDFS and this can be achieved only through in memory data sharing the in memory data sharing is 10 to 100 times faster than network and disk sharing and RDDs tried to solve all the problems by enabling fault tolerant distributed in memory computations. So now let's understand what are RDDs. It stands for resilient distributed data set. They are considered to be the backbone of spark and is one of the fundamental data structure of spark. It is also known as the schema less structures that can handle both structured and unstructured data. So in spark anything you do is around RDD. You're reading the data in spark then it is read into RDD again when you're transforming the data then you're performing transformations on old RDD and creating a new one. Then at last you will perform some actions on the RDD and store that data present in an RDD to a persistent storage resilient distributed data set is an immutable distributed collection of objects. Your objects can be anything like strings lines rows objects collections etc. RDDs can contain any type of Python Java or Scala objects even including user defined classes as well and talking about the distributed environment. Each data set present in an RDD is divided into logical partitions which may be computed on different nodes of the cluster. Due to this you can perform transformations or actions on the complete data parallelly and you don't have to worry about the distribution because spark takes care of that RDDs are highly resilient. That is they are able to recover quickly from any issues as the same data chunks are replicated across multiple executor nodes. Thus even if one executor fails another will still process the data. This allows you to perform functional calculations against your data set very quickly by harnessing the power of multiple nodes. So this is all about RDD. Now let's have a look at some of the important features of RDDs. RDDs have a provision of in memory computation and all transformations are lazy. That is it does not compute the results right away until an action is applied. So it supports in memory computation and lazy evaluation as well. Next fault tolerant in case of RDDs they track the data lineage information to rebuild the lost data automatically and this is how it provides fault tolerance to the system. Next immutability data can be created or retrieved anytime and once defined its value cannot be changed and that is the reason why I said RDDs are immutable. Next partitioning it is the fundamental unit of parallelism in spark RDD and all the data chunks are divided into partitions in RDD. Next persistence users can reuse RDD and choose a storage strategy for them. Coarse grained operations applies to all elements in data sets through maps or filter or group by operations. So these are the various features of RDD. Now let's see the ways to create RDD. There are three ways to create RDDs. One can create RDD from parallelized collections and one can also create RDD from the existing RDD or other RDDs 
and it can also be created from external data sources as well like HDFS Amazon S3 HBase etc. Now let me show you how to create RDDs. I'll open my terminal and first check whether my demons are running or not. Cool. Here I can see that Hadoop and Spark demons both are running. So now at the first, let's start the Spark shell. It will take a bit time to start the shell. Cool. Now the Spark shell has started and I can see the version of Spark as 2.1.1 and we have a Scala shell over here. Now I will tell you how to create RDDs in three different ways using Scala language. At the first, let's see how to create an RDD from parallelized collections. SC.parallelize is a method that I use to create a parallelized collection of RDDs. And this method is a Spark context parallelize method to create a parallelized collection. So I will give SC.parallelize and here I will parallelize 1 to 100 numbers in five different partitions and I will apply collect as the action to start the process. So here in the result you can see an array of 1 to 100 numbers. Okay. Now let me show you how the partitions appear in the web UI of spark. So the web UI port for spark is localhost 4040. So here you have just completed one task that is sc dot parallelize collect correct. Here you can see all the five stages that are succeeded because we have divided the task into five partitions. So let me show you the partitions. So this is a DAG visualization that is the directed or cyclic graph visualization wherein you have applied only parallelize as a method. So you can see only one stage here. So here you can see the RDD that has been created and coming to even timeline. You can see the task that has been executed in five different stages and the different colors imply the scheduler delay task deserialization time shuffle read time shuffle write time executor computing time etc. Here you can see the summary metrics for the created RDD here you can see that the maximum time it took to execute the task in five partitions parallelly is just 45 milliseconds. You can also see the executor ID the host ID the status that is succeeded duration launch time etc. So this is one way of creating an RDD from parallelized collections. Now let me show you how to create an RDD from the existing RDD. Okay. Here I'll create an array called a1 and assign numbers 1 to 10. 1 2 3 4 5 6 7. Okay. So I got the result here that is I have created an integer array of 1 to 10. And now I will parallelize this array one. Sorry, I got an error. It is a C dot parallelize of a one. Okay, so I created an RDD called parallel collection. Cool. Now I will create a new RDD from the existing RDD. That is val new RDD is equal to a1 dot map data present in an RDD. I will create a new RDD from existing RDD. So here I will take A1 as a reference and map the data and multiply that data into two. So what should be your output? If I map the data present in an RDD into two, so it would be like two, four, six, eight up to twenty. Correct? So let's see how it works. Yes, we got the output that is multiple of 1 to 10 that is 2, 4, 6, 8 up to 20. So this is one of the method of creating a new RDD from an old RDD and I have one more method that is from external file sources. So what I will do here is I will give var test is equal to sc dot text file. Here I will give the path to HDFS file location and link the path. That is HDFS localhost 9000 is the path. And I have a folder called example and in that I have a file called sample. Cool. So I got one more RDD created here. Now let me show you this file that I have already kept in HDFS directory. I will browse the file system and I will show you the slash example directory that I have created. So here you can see the example that I have created as a directory. And here I have sample as the input file that I have been given. So here you can see the same path location 
So this is how I can create an RDD from external file sources. In this case, I have used HDFS as an external file source. So this is how we can create RDDs from three different ways that is parallelized collections from external RDDs and from an existing RDDs. So let's move further and see the various RDD operations. RDD supports two main operations namely transformations and actions as I've already said RDDs are immutable. So once you create an RDD you cannot change any content in the RDD. So you might be wondering how RDD applies those transformations correct when you run any transformations it runs those transformations on old RDD and create a new RDD. This is basically done for optimization reasons. Transformations are the operations which are applied on an RDD to create a new RDD. Now these transformations work on the principle of lazy evaluations. So what does it mean? It means that when we call some operation in RDD it does not execute immediately and spark maintains the record of the operation that is being called since transformations are lazy in nature so we can execute the operation anytime by calling an action on the data. Hence in lazy evaluation data is not loaded until it is necessary. Now these actions analyze the RDD and produce result simple action can be count which will count the rows in RDD and then produce a result. So I can say that transformation produce new RDD and action produce results before moving further with the discussion. Let me tell you about the three different workloads that spark caters. They are batch mode interactive mode and streaming mode. In case of batch mode we run a batch job you write a job and then schedule it. It works through a queue or a batch of separate jobs without manual intervention. Then in case of interactive mode it is an interactive shell where you go and execute the commands one by one. So you will execute one command check the result and then execute other command based on the output result and so on. It works similar to the SQL shell. So shell is the one which executes the driver program and in the shell mode you can run it on the cluster mode. It is generally used for development work or it is used for ad hoc queries. Then comes the streaming mode where the program is continuously running as in when the data comes it takes the data and do some transformations and actions on the data and get some results. So these are the three different workloads that spark caters. Now let's see a real time use case. Here I am considering Yahoo as an example. So what are the problems of Yahoo? Yahoo properties are highly personalized to maximize relevance. The algorithms used to provide personalization that is the targeted advertisement and personalized content are highly sophisticated and the relevance model must be updated frequently because stories news feed and ads change in time. And Yahoo has over 150 petabytes of data that is stored on 35,000 node Hadoop cluster, which should be accessed efficiently to avoid latency caused by the data movement and to gain insights from the data in a cost effective manner. So, to overcome these problems, Yahoo looked to Spark to improve the performance of its iterative model training. Here, the machine learning algorithm for news personalization required 15,000 lines of C code. On the other hand, the machine learning algorithm has just 120 lines of Scala code. So that is the advantage of Spark. And this algorithm was ready for production use in just 30 minutes of training on 100 million datasets. And Spark's rich API is available in several programming languages and has resilient in memory storage options and is compatible with Hadoop through Yarn and the Spark Yarn project. It uses Apache Spark for personalizing its news web pages and for targeted advertising. Not only that, it also uses machine learning algorithms that run on Apache Spark to find out what kind of news users are interested to read and also for categorizing the news stories to find out what kind of users would be interested in reading each category of news. And Spark runs over Hadoop Yarn to use existing data and clusters. And the extensive API of Spark and machine learning library is the development of machine learning algorithms. And Spark reduces the latency of model training via in memory RDD. So, this is how Spark has helped Yahoo to improve the performance and achieve the targets. So, this is the Spark architecture. In your master node, you have the driver program which drives your application. So the code that you're writing behaves as a driver program or if you are using the interactive shell the shell acts as a driver program. 
inside the driver program the first thing that you do is you create a spark context assume that the spark context is a gateway to all spark functionality it is similar to your database connection so any command you execute in your database goes through the database connection similarly anything you do on spark goes through the spark context now this spark context works with the cluster manager to manage various jobs the driver program and the spark context takes care of executing the job across the cluster a job is split into the tasks and then these tasks are distributed over the worker node so anytime you create a rdd in the spark context that rdd can be distributed across various nodes and can be cached there so rdd is set to be taken partitioned and distributed across various nodes now worker nodes are the slave nodes whose job is to basically execute the tasks the task is then executed on the partition rdds in the worker nodes and then returns the result back to the spark context spark context takes the job breaks the job into the task and distribute them on the worker nodes and these tasks works on partition rdds perform whatever operations you wanted to perform and then collect the result and give it back to the main spark context if you increase the number of workers then you can divide jobs in more partitions and execute them parallelly over multiple systems this will be actually a lot more faster also if you increase the number of workers it will also increase your memory and you can cache the jobs so that it can be executed much more faster so this is all about spark architecture now let me give you an infographic idea about the spark architecture it follows master slave architecture here the client submits spark user application code when an application code is submitted driver implicitly converts a user code that contains transformations and actions into a logically directed graph called dag at this stage it also performs optimizations such as pipelining transformations then it converts a logical graph called dag into physical execution plan with many stages after converting into physical execution plan it creates a physical execution units called tasks under each stage then these tasks are bundled and sent to the cluster now driver talks to the cluster manager and negotiates the resources and cluster manager launches the needed executors at this point driver will also send the tasks to the executors based on the placement when executors start they register themselves with the drivers so that driver will have a complete view of the executors and executors now start executing the tasks that are assigned by the driver program at any point of time when the application is running driver program will monitor the set of executors that runs and the driver node also schedules a future task based on data placement so this is how the internal working takes place in spark architecture there are three different types of workloads that spark can cater first batch mode in case of batch mode we run a batch job here you write a job and then schedule it it works through a queue or batch of separate jobs through manual intervention next interactive mode this is an interactive shell where you go and execute the commands one by one so you will execute one command check the result and then execute the other command based on the output result and so on it works similar to the sql shell so shell is the one which executes a driver program so it is generally used for development work or it is also used for ad hoc queries then comes the streaming mode where the program is continuously running as in when the data comes it takes the data and do some transformations and actions on the data and then produce output results so these are the three different types of workloads that spark actually caters now let's move ahead and see a simple demo here let's understand how to create a spark application in spark shell using scala so let's understand how to create a spark application in spark shell using scala assume that we have a text file in the hdfs directory and we are counting the number of words in that text file so let's see how to do it so before i start running let me first check whether all my daemons are running or not so i'll type sudo jps so all my spark daemons and hadoop daemons are running that i have master worker as spark daemons and name node resource manager node manager everything as hadoop daemons so the first thing that i do here is i run the spark shell so it takes bit time to start in the meanwhile let me tell you the web ui port for spark shell is localhost 4040 so this is a web ui for spark like if you click on jobs right now we have not executed anything so there is no details over here 
so this you have job stages so once you execute the jobs you will be having the records of the tasks that you have executed here so here you can see the stages of various jobs and tasks executed so now let's check whether our spark shell has started or not yes so you have your spark version as 2.1.1 and you have a scala shell over here so before i start the code let's check the content that is present in the input text file by running this command so i'll write where test is equal to sc.txt file because i have saved a text file over there and i'll give the hdfs path location i've stored my text file in this location and sample is the name of the text file so now let me give test.collect so that it collects the data and displays the data that is present in the text file so in my text file i have hadoop research analyst data science and science so this is my input data so now let me map the functions and apply the transformations and actions so i'll give var map is equal to sc.txt file and i will specify my input path location so this is my input path location and i'll apply the flat map transformation to split the data that is separated by space and then map the word count to be given as word comma one now this will be executed yes now let me apply the action for this to start the execution of the task so let me tell you one thing here before applying an action the spark will not start the execution process so here i have applied reduce by key as the action to start counting the number of words in the text file so now we are done with applying transformations and actions as well so now the next step is to specify the output location to store the output file so i'll give as counts dot save as text file and then specify the location for my output file i'll store it in the same location where i have my input file and i will specify my output file name as output 9 cool i forgot to give a double quotes and i will run this so it's completed now so now let's see the output i will open my hadoop web ui by giving localhost 50070 and browse the file system to check the output so as i have said i have example as my directory that i have created and in that i have specified output 9 as my output so i have the two part files being created let's check each of them one by one so we have the data count as one analyst count as one and science count as two so this is the first part file now let me open the second part file for you so this is the second part file where you have hadoop count as one and the research count as one so now let me show you the text file that we have specified as the input so as i have told you hadoop count is one research count is one analyst one data one science and science as one one so you might be thinking data science is a one word no in the program code we have asked to count the word that is separated by a space so that is why we have science count as two i hope you got an idea about how word count works similarly i will now parallelize one to hundred numbers and divide the task into five partitions to show you what is partitions of task so i will write sc dot parallelize one to hundred numbers and divide them into five partitions and apply collect action to collect the numbers and start the execution so it displays you an array of one to hundred numbers now let me explain you the job stages partitions even timeline DAG representation and everything so now let me go to the web ui of spark and click on jobs so these are the tasks that you have submitted so coming to word count example so this is the DAG visualization i hope you can see it clearly first you collected the text file then you applied flat map transformation and mapped it to count the number of words and then applied reduce by key action and then save the output file as save as text file so this is the entire tag visualization of the number of steps that we have covered in our program so here it shows the completed stages that is two stages and it also shows the duration that is two seconds and if you click on the event timeline it just shows the executor that is added 
and in this case you cannot see any partitions because you have not split the jobs into various partitions. So this is how you can see the event timeline and the DAG visualization. Here you can also see the stage ID descriptions when you have submitted that. I have just submitted it now. And in this, it also shows the duration that it took to execute the task and the output bytes that it took, the shuffle read, shuffle write, and many more. Now to show you the partitions, see in this you just applied sc.parallelize, right? So it is just showing one stage where you have applied the parallelized transformation. Here it shows the succeeded task as 5 by 5. That is, you have divided the task into 5 stages and all the 5 stages has been executed successfully. Now here you can see the partitions of the 5 different stages that is executed in parallel. So depending on the colors, it shows the scheduler delay, the shuffle rate time, executor computing time, result serialization time and getting result time and many more. So you can see the duration that it took to execute the five tasks in parallel at the same time is maximum one milliseconds. So in memory spark has a much faster computation and you can see the IDs of all the five different tasks. All are success. You can see the locality level. You can see the executor and the host IP ID the launch time the duration it take everything. So you can also see that we have created RDT and parallelized it. Similarly here also for word count example you can see the RDD that has been created and also the actions that you have applied to execute the task. And you can see the duration that it took even here also it's just one milliseconds that it took to execute the entire word count example and you can see the ID is locality level executor ID. So in this case we have just executed the task in two stages. So it is just showing the two stages. So this is all about how web UI looks and what are the features and information that you can see in the web UI of spark after executing the program and the Scala shell. So in this program you can see that first we gave the path to the input location and check the data that is presented in the input file and then we applied flat map transformations and created RDD and then applied action to start the execution of the task and save the output file in this location. So I hope you got a clear idea of how to execute a word count example and check for the various features in Spark Web UI like partitions, DAG visualizations and everything. So here are a few reasons why Spark is considered to be the most powerful big data tool in the current year. Firstly, its ability to integrate itself with Hadoop. Spark can be integrated well with Hadoop and that's a great advantage for those who are familiar with LATA, technically a standalone project. Spark has designed in the way to run on Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS. It can be straight away got into work with MapR. It can run on HDFS inside MapReduce. Having deployed on YAN, it can even run on the same cluster along the side of MapReduce shops. Followed by the first reason, the second reason says that it can meet the global standards. According to the technology forecast, Spark is the future of worldwide big data processing. The standards of big data analytics are rising immensely with Spark and driven by high speed data processing and real time results. By learning Spark now, one can meet the global standards to ensure compatibility between next generation of Spark applications and distributions by being a part of Spark developers community. If you think you love technology, contributing in the development of growing technology and its growing stage can give a boost to your career. After this, you can stay up to date with latest advancements that take place in Spark and be among the initial ones to build the next generation of big data applications. The third reason says that it is highly faster than MapReduce because Spark is an in-memory data processing framework and is all set up to take all the primary processing for Hadoop workloads in future. Being way faster and easier to program than MapReduce, Spark is now among the top level Apache projects which has acquired the apostle of large community of users as well as contributors. But Tai Zaharia, CTO Databricks and one of the brains behind Apache Spark projects puts forth Spark as a multi-phase query tool that could help democratize the use of big data. He also projected the possibility of end of MapReduce era with the growth of Apache Spark. Followed by the third reason, we have the fourth reason which says 
Spark is capable to perform in production environment. The number of companies that are using Spark or are planning to the same has exploded over the last year. There is a massive surge in the popularity of Spark. The reason being is its mature open source components and an expanding community of users. The reasons why Spark has become one of the most popular projects in big data are the ingrained high performance tools handling distinct problems and workloads and a swift and simple programming interface in high end programming languages like Scala, Java and Python. There are several reasons as to why enterprises are increasingly adopting Spark ranging from speed and efficiency and ease of use to single integrated system for all the data pipelines and many more. Spark being the most active big data project has been deployed in production by all major Hadoop as well as non Hadoop vendors across multiple sectors including financial services, retail, media houses, telecommunications and public sectors. Now the last important reason for Spark being so powerful is its rising demand for Spark developers. Spark is a brand new and yet completely spread out in the big data market. The use of Spark is increasing at a very fast speed among many of the top notch companies like NASA, Yahoo, Adobe and many more. Apart from those belonging to Spark community, there is a handful of professionals who have learned Spark and can work with it. This in turn has created a soaring demand for Spark developers. In such scenario, learning Spark can give you a steep competitive edge. By learning Spark at this point, in time, you can demonstrate the recognized validation for your experience. This is what John Triper and Alliances and Ecosystem Lead at Databricks has to say. The adoption of Apache Spark by business, large and small, is growing at an incredible rate across a wide range of industries and the demand for developers with certified expertise is quickly following suit. So these were the few important reasons why Apache Spark is considered to be the most powerful tool in the current IT industry. Let's move ahead and understand the roadmap to become an Apache Spark developer. There is always a thin line of gap between actually becoming a certified Apache Spark developer and to be an actual Spark developer capable enough to perform in real time application. So how do we become a certified Apache Spark developer who is capable to perform in real time? So the step by step approach to the scene is given as below. To become an expert level Spark developer, you need to follow the right path and the expert level guidance from the certified real time industry experts in the industry. For a beginner, it is the best time to take up a training and certification exam. Once the certification has begun, you should start up with your own projects to understand the working terminology of Apache Spark. Spark's major building blocks, which are the RDDs or resilient distributed datasets and data frames. Also, Spark has the capability to integrate itself with high performance programming languages like Python, Scala, and Java. PySpark RDDs are the best examples for the combination of Python and Apache Spark. You can also understand how to integrate Java with Apache Spark through an amazing article called Spark Java Tutorial Article from Edureka, which I have linked in the description box below. Once you have the better grip on the major building blocks of Spark, which are the RDDs and data frames, you can move ahead into learning some of the major components of Apache Spark, which are mentioned as below, which are the Spark SQL, Spark MLlib, Spark Graphics, Spark R, and Spark Streaming, and a lot more. Once you get the required training and certification, it's time for you to take most important and bigger leap, the CCA 175 certification. You can begin solving some sample CCA 175 and Spark certification examination papers which I have linked in the description box below. And once you get a briefer idea and confidence, you can register for the CCA 175 examination and excel with your true Spark and Hadoop developer certification. So this is the roadmap to become a true and certified Apache Spark developer. Now that we have discussed about the roadmap to become an Apache Spark developer, let us move ahead and discuss about the Apache Spark developer's salary. Apache Spark developer is one of the most highly decorated professionals with handsome salary packages compared to others. We will now discuss the salary trends of Apache Spark developers in different nations. First, India. In India, the average salary offered to an entry level Spark developer is between 6 lakhs to 10 lakhs per annum. And on the other hand, for an experience level Spark developer, the salary trends are in between 25 lakhs to 40 lakhs per annum. Next, the United States of America. In the United States of America, 
The salary offered for a beginner level Spark developer is 75,000 to 100,000 US dollars per annum. Similarly, for an experienced level Spark developer, the salary trends lie between $145,000 to $175,000 per annum. Now with this, let us move ahead and discuss the skills of a Spark developer. The skills required to become an excellent Spark developer are to be capable enough to load the data from different platforms into Hadoop platform using various EDL tools. Decide an effective file format for a specific task. Based on business requirements, clean data through streaming API or user defined functions. Effectively schedule Hadoop jobs, hand holding with Hive and HBase for schema operations. Followed by that, you should have a capability to work on Hive tables and to assign schemas. Deploy HBase clusters and continuously manage them. Execute pig and hive scripts to perform various joins in datasets. Apply different HDFS formats and structures like to speed up analytics. Maintaining the privacy and security of Hadoop clusters, fine tuning of Hadoop applications, troubleshooting and debugging any Hadoop ecosystem at runtime, and finally, installing, configuring, and maintaining enterprise Hadoop environment if required. Now we shall move ahead and understand the Apache Spark developers roles and responsibilities. The roles and responsibilities of a Spark developer are to be capable enough to write executable code for analytics services and Spark components, knowledge in high performance programming languages like Java, Python and Scala, should be well versed with related technologies like Apache Kafka, Storm, Hadoop and Zookeeper, Ready to be responsible for system analysis that include design, coding, unit testing, and other software development lifecycle activities, gathering user requirements and converting them into strong technical tasks and provide economical estimates for the same. Should be a team player with global standards so as to understand project delivery risks. Ensure the quality of technical analysis and expertise in solving issues. Review code, use case, and ensure it meets the requirements. So these were the few roles and responsibilities of a Spark developer. Now let us move ahead and learn the companies that are using Apache Spark. Apache Spark is one of the widest spread technology that has changed the faces of many IT industries and helped them to achieve their current accomplishments and further. Let us now discuss some of the tech giants and major players in IT industries that are under the use of Spark. Few of the companies are Oracle, Dell, Yahoo, CGI, Facebook, Cognizant, Capgemini, Amazon, IBM, LinkedIn, Accenture, and many more. Now, before I start off with PySpark, let me first brief you about the PySpark ecosystem. As you can see from the diagram, the Spark ecosystem is composed of various components like Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, MLLib, Graphics, and the Core API component. The Spark SQL component is used to leverage the power of declarative queries and optimize storage by executing SQL-like queries on Spark data, which is presented in RDDs and other external sources. Spark Streaming component allows developers to perform batch processing and streaming of data with ease in the same application. The machine learning library eases the development and deployment of scalable machine learning pipelines. Graphics component lets the data scientists work with graph and non-graph sources to achieve flexibility and resilience in graph construction and transformations. And finally, the Spark Core component. It is the most vital component of Spark ecosystem, which is responsible for basic input-output functions, scheduling, and monitoring. The entire Spark ecosystem is built on top of this core execution engine, which has extensible APIs in different languages like Scala, Python, R, and Java. And in today's session, I will specifically discuss about the Spark API in Python programming languages, which is more popularly known as the PySpark. Now you might be wondering why PySpark? Well, to get a better insight, let me give you a brief into PySpark. Now, as we already know, PySpark is the collaboration of two powerful technologies, which are Spark, which is an open source clustering computing framework built around speed, ease of use, and streaming analytics. And the other one is Python, of course. Python, which is a general purpose high level programming language. It provides wide range of libraries and is majorly used for machine learning and real time analytics. Now, which gives us PySpark, which is a Python API for Spark that lets you harness the simplicity of Python and the power of Apache Spark in order to tame big data. A PySpark also lets you use the RDDs and come with the default integration of Py4j library. We'll learn about RDDs later in this video. 
Now that you know what is PySpark, let's now see the advantages of using Spark with Python. As we all know, Python itself is very simple and easy. So when Spark is written in Python, it makes Apache Spark quite easy to learn and use. Moreover, it's a dynamically typed language, which means RDDs can hold objects of multiple data types. Not only this, it also makes the API simple and comprehensive. And talking about the readability of code, maintenance and familiarity with the Python API for Apache Spark is far better than other programming languages. Python also provides various options for visualization, which is not possible using Scala or Java. Moreover, you can conveniently call R directly from Python. On top of this, Python comes with a wide range of libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Kitlin, Seaborn, Matplotlib, and these library aids in data analysis and also provide mature and time-tested statistics. With all these features, you can effortlessly program in PySpark in case you get stuck somewhere or have a doubt. There is a huge PySpark community out there whom you can reach out and put your query, and that is very active. So I will make good use of this opportunity to show you how to install PySpark in your system. Now here I'm using a Red Hat Linux based CentOS system. The same steps can be applied for using Linux systems as well. So in order to install PySpark, first make sure that you have Hadoop installed in your system. So if you want to know more about how to install Hadoop, please check out our Hadoop playlist on YouTube, or you can check out our blog on Edureka website. Now, first of all, you need to go to the Apache Spark official website, which is spark.apache.org. In the download section, you can download the latest version of Spark release, which supports the latest version of Hadoop or Hadoop version 2.7 or above. Now, once you have downloaded it, all you need to do is extract it or rather say untar the file contents. And after that, you need to put in the path where the Spark is installed in the bash RC file. Now you also need to install pip and Jupyter notebook using the pip command and make sure that the version of pip is 10 or above. So as you can see here, this is what our bash RC file looks like. Here you can see that we have put in the path for Hadoop, Spark, and as well as PySpark driver Python, which is the Jupyter notebook. What it'll do is that the moment you run the PySpark shell, it will automatically open a Jupyter notebook for you. Now I find Jupyter notebook very easy to work with rather than the shell. It's a personal choice. Now that we are done with the installation part, let's now dive deeper into PySpark and learn few of its fundamentals, which you need to know in order to work with PySpark. Now this timeline shows the various topics which we will be covering under the PySpark fundamentals. So let's start off with the very first topic in our list, that is the Spark context. The Spark context is the heart of any Spark application. It sets up internal services and establishes a connection to a Spark execution environment. Through a Spark context object, you can create RDDs, accumulators, and broadcast variables, access Spark services, run jobs, and much more. The Spark context allows the Spark driver application to access the cluster through a resource manager, which can be Yarn or Spark's cluster manager. The driver program then runs the operations inside the executors on the worker nodes, and Spark context uses the Py4j to launch a JVM, which in turn creates a Java Spark context. Now there are various parameters which can be used with the Spark context object like the master, app name, Spark home, the pi files, the environment in which it's set, the batch size, serializer, configuration, gateway, and much more. Among these parameters, the master and app name are the most commonly used. Now to give you a basic insight on how a Spark program works, I have listed down its basic lifecycle phases. The typical life cycle of a Spark program includes creating RDDs from external data sources or parallelize a collection in your driver program. Then we have the lazy transformation. You know, lazily transforming the base RDDs into new RDDs using transformation, then caching few of those RDDs for future reuse, and finally performing action to execute parallel computation and to produce the results. The next topic in our list is RDD, and I'm sure people who have already worked with Spark are familiar with this term. But for people who are new to it, let me just explain it. Now, RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset. It is considered to be the building block of any Spark application. The reason behind this is these elements run and operate on multiple nodes to do parallel processing on a cluster. And once you create a RDD, it becomes immutable. And by immutable, I mean that it is an object whose state cannot be modified after it is created. But we can transform its values by applying certain transformation. They have good fault tolerance ability and can automatically recover from almost any failures. This adds an added advantage. Now to achieve a certain task, multiple operations can be applied on these RDDs which are categorized in two ways. The first is the transformation and the second one is the actions. 
Now, transformations are the operations which are applied on an RDD to create a new RDD. Now, these transformations work on the principle of lazy evaluation. And transformations are lazy in nature, meaning when we call some operation in RDD, it does not execute immediately. Spark maintains the record of the operations it is being called through with the help of dialectic acyclic graphs, which is also known as DAGs. And since the transformations are lazy in nature, so when we execute operation anytime by calling an action on the data, the lazy evaluation data is not loaded until it's necessary. And the moment we call out the action, all the computations are performed parallelly to give you the desired output. Now, a few important transformations are the map, flat map, filter, distinct, reduce by key, map partition, sort by. Actions are the operations which are applied on an RDD to instruct a party spark to apply computation and pass the result back to the driver. Few of these actions include collect, the collect as map, reduce, take, first. Now let me implement few of these for your better understanding. So first of all, let me show you the bash RC file which I was talking about. So here you can see in the bash RC file we provide the path for all the frameworks which we have installed in the system. So for example, you can see here we have installed Hadoop. The moment we install and unzip it or rather say untar it, I have shifted all my frameworks to one particular location. As you can see, it's the USR, the user, and inside this we have the library, and inside that I have installed the Hadoop and also the Spark. Now, as you can see here, we have two lines. I'll highlight this one for you. The PySpark driver Python, which is the Jupyter, and we have given it as a notebook. The option available as notebook. What it'll do is that the moment I start Spark, it will automatically redirect me to the Jupyter notebook. So let me just rename this notebook as RDD Tutorial. So let's get started. So here to load any file into an RDD, suppose I'm loading a text file, you need to use the SC, which is a Spark context, sc.txt file, and you need to provide the path of the data which you are going to load. So one thing to keep in mind is that the default path which the RDD takes or the Jupyter Notebook takes is the SDFS path. So in order to use the local file system, you need to mention the file colon and double forward slashes. Now once our sample data is inside the RDD, now to have a look at it, we need to invoke using it the action. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first five objects or I rather say the first five elements of this particular RDD. Now the sample data I have taken here is about blockchain. As you can see, we have one, two, three, four and five elements here. Suppose I need to convert all the data into a low case and split it according to word by word. So for that, I'll create a function. And in that function, I'll pass on this RDD. So I'm creating, as you can see here, I'm creating RDD1, that is a new RDD, and using the map function, or rather say the transformation, and passing on the function, which I just created, to lower and to split it. So if we have a look at the output of RDD1, so you can see here, all the words are in the lower case, and all of them are separated with the help of a space bar. Now, there's another transformation which is known as the flat map to give you a flattened output and I'm passing the same function which I created earlier. So let's go ahead and have a look at the output for this one. So as you can see here, we got the first five elements which are the same one as we got here, the contracts, transactions, and anti records. So just one thing to keep in mind is that the flat map is a transformation whereas take is the action. Now, as you can see that contents of the sample data contains stop words. So in, if I want to remove all the stop words, all I need to do is start and create a list of stop words in which I have mentioned here. As you can see, we have A, all, the, as, is, and. Now these are not all the stop words. So I've chosen only a few of them just to show you what exactly the output will be. And now we are using here the filter transformation. And with the help of lambda function in which we have X specified as X not in stop words. And we have created another RDD, which is RDD3, which will take the input from RDD2. So let's go ahead and see whether the and and the are removed or not. So as you can see, contracts, transaction, records of them. If you look at the output five, we have contracts, transaction, and and the. And and the are not in this list. Now suppose I want to group the data according to the first three characters of any element. 
So for that, I'll use the group by and I'll use the lambda function again. So let's have a look at the output. So you can see we have EDG and edges. So the first three letters of both words are same. Similarly, we can find it using the first two letters also. Let me just change it to two. So you can see we have GU and GUID, which is the guide. Now these are the basic transformations and actions. But suppose I want to find out the sum of the first thousand numbers, or rather say first ten thousand numbers. All I need to do is initialize another RDD, which is the num underscore RDD, and we use the SC dot parallelize. And the range we have given is one to ten thousand. And we'll use the reduce action here to see the output. As you can see here we have the sum of the numbers ranging from 1 to 10,000. Now, this was all about RDD. Now, next topic that we have on our list is broadcasts and accumulators. Now, in Spark, we perform parallel processing through the help of shared variables. Or when the driver sends any task to the executor present on the cluster, a copy of the shared variable is also sent to the each node of the cluster, thus maintaining high availability and fault tolerance. Now, this is done in order to accomplish the task. And Apache Spark supports two type of shared variables. One of them is broadcast and the other one is the accumulator. Now broadcast variables are used to save the copy of data on all the nodes in a cluster, whereas the accumulator is the variable that is used for aggregating the incoming information via different associative and commutative operations. Now moving on to our next topic, which is a Spark configuration. Now Spark configuration class provides a set of configurations and parameters that are needed to execute a Spark application on the local system or any cluster. Now when you use Spark configuration object to set the values to these parameters, they automatically take priority over the system properties. Now this class contains various getters and setter methods, now some of which are set method which is used to set a configuration property. We have the set master which is used for setting the master URL. We have the set app name which is used to set an application name and we have the get method to retrieve a configuration value of a key and finally we have set spark home which is used for setting the spark installation path on worker nodes now coming to the next topic on our list which is the spark files the spark file class contains only the class methods so that the user cannot create any spark files instance now this helps in resolving the path of the files that are added using the spark context add file method the class spark files contain two class methods which are the get method and the get root directory method now the get is used to retrieve the absolute path of a file added through spark context dot add file and the get root directory is used to retrieve the root directory that contains the files that are added through the spark context dot add file now these are small topics and the next topic that we will covering in our list are the data frames now data frames in Apache Spark is a distributed collection of rows under named columns, which is similar to the relational database tables or Excel sheets. It also shares common attributes with the RDDs. Few characteristics of data frames are immutable in nature. That is the same as you can create a data frame, but you cannot change it. It allows lazy evaluation. That is the task not executed unless and until an action is triggered. And moreover, data frames are distributed in nature, which are designed for processing large collection of structured or semi-structured data. It can be created using different data formats, like loading the data from source files such as JSON or CSV, or you can load it from an existing RDD. You can use databases like Hive, Cassandra. You can use Parquet files. You can use CSV, XML files. There are many sources through which you can create a particular RDD. Now let me show you how to create a data frame in PySpark and perform various actions and transformations on it. So let's continue this in the same notebook which we have here. Now here we have taken the NYC flight data and I'm creating a data frame which is the NYC flights underscore df. Now to load the data we are using the spark.read.csv method. I need to provide the path which is the local path. By default it takes the SDFS same as RDD. And one thing to note down here is that I've provided two parameters extra here, which is the info schema and the header. If we do not provide this as true or we skip it, what will happen is that if your data set contains the name of the columns on the first row, it will take those as data as well. It will not infer the schema. Now, once we have loaded the data in our data frame, we need to use the show action to have a look at the output. So as you can see here, we have the output, which is exactly it gives us the top 20 rows of the particular data set. We have the year, month, day, departure time, departure delay, arrival time, arrival delay, and so many more attributes. 
Now to print the schema of the particular data frame you need the transformation or as say the action of print schema So let's have a look at the schema as you can see here We have year which is integer month integer almost half of them are integer We have the carrier as string the tail number as string we have the origin string destination string and so on now suppose I want to know how many records are there in my database or the data frame I'd rather say so you need the count function for this one and it will provide you with the results So as you can see here we have 3.3 million records here 3 million 36 thousand seven hundred seventy six to be exact Now suppose I want to have a look at the flight name the origin and the destination of just these three columns for the particular data frame We need to use the select option So as you can see here we have the top 20 rows now what we saw was the select query on this particular data frame but if I want to see or rather I want to check the summary of any particular column suppose I want to check the what is the lowest count or the highest count in the particular distance column I need to use the describe function here so I'll show you what the summary looks like so the distance the count is the number of rows total number of rows we have the mean the standard deviation we have the minimum value which is 17 and the maximum value which is 4983 now this gives you a summary of the particular column if you want to now that we know that the minimum distance is 17 let's go ahead and filter out our data using the filter function in which the distance is 17 so you can see here we have one data in which in the 2013 year the minimum distance here is 17 now similarly we suppose I want to have a look at the flights which are originating from EWR similarly we'll use the filter function here as well now there is another clause here which is the where clause it is also used for filtering now suppose I want to have a look at the flight data and filter it out to see if the day at which the flight took off was the second of any month suppose so here instead of filter we can also use a where clause which will give us the same output now we can also pass on multiple parameters and rather say the multiple conditions so suppose I want the day of the flight should be 7th and the origin should be JFK and the arrival delay should be less than 0 I mean that is for none of the postponed flights so uh, just to have a look at these numbers we'll use the way clause and separate all the conditions using the AND symbol so as you can see here all the data the day is 7 the origin is JFK and the arrival delay is less than zero now these were the basic transformations and actions on a particular data frame now one thing we can also do is create a temporary table for SQL queries if someone is not good or is not acquainted to all these transformation and action and would rather use SQL queries on the data they can use this register dot temp table to create a table for their particular data frame what it'll do is convert the NYC flights underscore DF data frame into a NYC underscore flight table, which can be used later and SQL queries can be performed on this particular table. So you remember in the beginning we used the NYC flights underscore DF dot show. Now we can use the select asterisk from NYC underscore flights to get the same output. Now suppose we want to look at the minimum air time of any flights. We use the select minimum airtime from NYC flights. That is the SQL query. We pass all the SQL query in the SQL context or SQL function. So as you can see here, we have the minimum airtime as 20. Now to have a look at the records in which the airtime is minimum 20. Now we can also use nested SQL queries. Now suppose if I want to check which all flights have the minimum airtime as 20. Now that cannot be done in a simple SQL query. We need nested query for that one. So selecting asterisk from New York flights where the airtime is in and inside that we have another query which is select minimum airtime from NYC flights. Let's see if this works or not. So yes, as you can see here, we have two flights which have the minimum airtime as 20. So guys, this is it for data frames. So let's get back to our presentation and have a look at the list which we were following. We completed data frames. Uh, next we have storage levels. Now storage level in PySpark is a class which helps in deciding how the RDDs should be stored. Now based on this RDDs are either stored in disk or in memory or in both. 
the class storage level also decides whether the RDD should be serialized or replicate its partition. So the final and the last topic for or the today's list is the MLlib. Now MLlib is the machine learning API which is provided by Spark, which is also present in Python. And this library is heavily used in Python for machine learning as well as real-time streaming analytics. Now various algorithms supported by these libraries are so first of all we have the Spark.mllib. Now recently the Spy Spark MLlib supports model-based collaborative filtering by a small set of latent factors and here all the users and the products are described which we can use to predict the missing entries. However, to learn these latent factors spark.mllib uses the alternating least square which is the ALS algorithm. Next we have the mllib.clustering and a supervised learning problem is clustering. Now here we try to group subsets of entities with one another on the basis of some notion of similarity. Next we have the frequent pattern matching which is the FPM. Now frequent pattern matching is mining frequent items, item sets, subsequences or other substructures that are usually among the first steps to analyze a large scale data set. This has been an active research topic in data mining for years. We have the linear algebra. Now this algorithm supports PySpark MLLib utilities for linear algebra. We have collaborative filtering. We have classification. For binary classification, various methods are available in spark.mllib packets such as multi-class classification as well as regression analysis. In classification, some of the most popular algorithms used are naive bias, random forest, decision tree, and so much. And finally, we have the linear regression. Now basically, linear regression comes from the family of regression algorithms. To find relationships and dependencies between variables is the main goal of regression. Although PySpark MLlib package also covers other algorithm classes and functions, let's now try to implement all the concepts which we have learned in PySpark tutorial session. Now here we are going to use a heart disease prediction model and we are going to predict it using the decision tree with the help of classification as well as regression. Now these all are part of the MLlib library here. Let's see how we can perform these types of functions and queries. So first of all, what we need to do is initialize the Spark context. So next we are going to read the UCI dataset of the heart disease prediction and we are going to clean the data. So let's import the pandas and the numpy library here. Now let's create a data frame as heart disease df and as mentioned earlier, we are going to use the read CSV method here. And here we don't have a header, so we have provided header as none. Now the original data set contains 303 rows and 14 columns. Now the categories of diagnosis of heart disease that we are predicting if the value 0 is for 50% less than narrowing and for the value 1 which we are giving is for the values which have 50% more diameter of narrowing. So here we are using the numpy library. Now these are particularly old methods which is showing the deprecated warning but no issues it will work fine. So as you can see here we have the categories of diagnosis of heart disease that we are predicting the value 0 is for less than 50 and value 1 is greater than 50. So what we did here was clear the row which have the question mark or which have the empty spaces. Now to get a look at the data set here now you can see here we have 0 at many places instead of the question mark which we had earlier. And now we are saving it to a txt file. And you can see here after dropping the rows with any empty values, we have 297 rows and 14 columns. Now this is what the new clear data set looks like. Now we are importing the MLlib library and the regression here. Now here what we are going to do is create a label point which is a local vector associated with a label or a response. So for that we need to import the mllib.regression. So for that we are taking the text file which we just created now without the missing values. Now next what we are going to do is pass the mllib data line by line into the mllib label point object and we are going to convert the minus one labels to the zero. Now let's have a look after passing the number of training lines. Okay we have the label point zero one. That's cool. 
Now next what we are going to do is perform classification using the decision tree. So for that we need to import the PySpark.mllib.tree. Now next what we have to do is split the data into the training and testing data and we split here the data into 70 to 30 which is a standard ratio. 70 being the training data set and the 30 percent being the testing data set. Now next what we do is that we train the model which we have created here using the training set. We have created a training model decision tree dot train classifier. We have used the training data number of classes is file the categorical feature which we have given maximum depth to which we are classifying it is three. The next what we are going to do is evaluate the model based on the test data set now and evaluate the error. So here we are creating predictions and we are using the test data to get the predictions through the model which we created here. And we are also going to find the test errors here. So as you can see here the test error is 0 0.2297. We have created a classification decision tree model in which the feature less than 12 is 3. The value of the features less than 0 is 54. So as you can see our model is pretty good. So now next we'll use regression for the same purposes. So let's perform the regression using decision tree. So as you can see we have the train model where we are using the decision tree dot train regressor using the training data the same which we created using the decision tree model up there. We use the classification now we are using regression. Now similarly we are going to evaluate our model using our test data set and find the test errors which is the mean squared error here for regression. So let's have a look at the mean squared error here. The mean squared error is 0 0.168 that is good. Now finally if we have a look at the learned regression tree model. As you can see we have created the regression tree model to the depth of 3 with 15 nodes and here we have all the features and classification of the tree. So guys looking at the system requirements. So guys here I'll be explaining you the minimum system requirements. So the minimum RAM required is around 4 GB but is advised to use an 8 GB RAM system and minimum free disk space should be 25 GB at least 25 GB. Now the minimum processor should be i3 or above to have a smooth programming experience and most of all the system should have a 64 bit operating system and in case if you are using a virtual machine or the virtual box and it should also support a 64 bit image of the operating system. Now these are all the hardware requirements. So coming at the software requirements, we need Java 8 or above. We need Hadoop 2.7 or above. As Spark runs on top of Hadoop, we need PIP with version 10. PIP is a package management system used to install and manage software packages written in Python. You can use Conda as well. And finally, we need the Jupyter Notebook. This step is optional. But the programming experience in Jupyter Notebook is far more better than the shell. So let's go ahead and see how we can install PySpark on our systems. So here I have a Windows system and in order to install PySpark, I'm using a virtual box and I'll create a virtual machine inside the virtual box because most of the time PySpark is being used in the Linux environment. So that's what I'm going to use. So let's see how we can install the virtual box. All you need to do is go to the official website of VirtualBox and on the download section you will find the latest version of VirtualBox. You need to click on the Windows host or Linux distribution. But if you have Linux you don't need the VirtualBox. So for the Windows you can click on this one and install. So I've already installed VirtualBox and I've created my VM. Now this VM has CentOS 7 as the base image. And our CentOS is Red Hat distribution operating system. So it also works on the Linux platform. Now firstly what we need to do is check whether we have Hadoop or Java installed or not. So for that we need to check the .bash rc file. Now the bash rc file contains the part to all the frameworks that are being used. So for example as you can see we have Hadoop installed on our system. We have all the path to the Hadoop. We have Java installed. So we can also check the Hadoop version which we are running. So as you can see we have Hadoop 2.7.3 and to check the Java version we need to type version. We have Java 8 running on the system. 
So now that we have Hadoop and Java installed in our system, we need to install Spark. To install Spark, we need to go to the Apache official website, and in that you need to go to spark.apache.org and slash downloads. There you can select which version of Spark you want, the stable version. So the latest version here is of June 8, 2018, and it is pre-built for Apache Hadoop 2.7 and later versions. So as we saw earlier, we have Hadoop 2.7.3, so that's good. Now to download Apache Spark, you need to click on this link. And here you'll get various mirror sites and links from where you can download the tar file. So I've already downloaded it. So let me show you guys. So guys, as you can see here, it's a TGC file, which is a tar file. Now we need to extract this file and place it in our specific location where we want. Let me just close this first. Now for that, first we need to go to downloads. As you can see, we have the Spark 2.3.1, Hadoop 2.7, TGZ. Now we need to untar this file. So we use so we use the command tar-xvzf and Spark 2.3.1 name. So what it'll do, it will extract it, or I'd rather say untar the file in the download section. So now if we look at the elements, list the elements. We can see we have Spark 2.3.1, pin Hadoop 2.7, and we have the tar file also. So what we need to do is move this to any specified location where we want our frameworks to be. So what I usually do is keep all my frameworks like Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, we have Flume, or Cassandra in my user library section. So the USR, LIB. As you can see, I have Cassandra, Flume, Hive, Maven, Storm, and here I have copied Spark. So now that we have copied Spark to a specific location, we need to put in its path in the bash RC file as well. So let me again open the bash RC file. So guys, as you can see here, I have put in the path for Apache Spark. So there are two paths you need to configure here, which is Spark Home and the path. Spark Home has the path for where Spark has been shifted after it has been untarred or rather say extracted from the tar file. And we need to also provide the path of the bin folder, which resides inside the Spark folder as well. So after we have mentioned the path in the dot bash RC file, we need to type in source and then dot bash RC. So what happens is the moment when we add the path of a particular framework or any application in our bash rc file, it is not saved. So in order to save it, we use the command source dot bash rc. So now in order to move to Spark, we just use cd and we use a dollar sign and we write Spark home. We are inside Spark. Now if we have a look at the elements inside Spark, we find there's a Python folder. If we go inside Python, here you can see we have all the different libraries and the set of files which are used to run PySpark and there's a PySpark folder too. And inside here we have various libraries for which Python is being used and the various programs also. So now that you have installed Spark and mentioned its path in the bash RC file, now it's time to install Jupyter Notebook as well. So to install Jupyter Notebook, first we need to install pip or conda. As I mentioned earlier, pip, it's a package management system and it's used to install and manage software packages. So this is the command to install pip. Now make sure that the pip version is 10 or above to install the Jupyter Notebook. Now, in order to install Jupyter after we have installed pip, we can use the command pip install Jupyter. Now, this will install the Jupyter Notebook in our system. And after it's been installed, if we need to use the Jupyter Notebook, we just type the Jupyter Notebook in our command line. And what it will do, it will open the Jupyter Notebook for us. So, as you can see here in the new section, we have the Python 2. So we'll use this while writing programs for PySpark. Now one thing to keep in mind is that we have the Jupyter Notebook here and we have PySpark, but Jupyter and PySpark are not communicating in between. Now to make that happen, we need to again go to the bash RC file. 
and once we have given the path for Spark, we need to provide the path for PySpark driver, which is Jupyter Notebook as well. So one more important thing to note is if you are using Spark for Scala, you need to provide the path for Scala as well. And for using Jupyter Notebook, all you need to do is put in these two lines of codes, which is PySpark driver, Python, which is Jupyter, and the driver Python options, which is Notebook. Now that we have Spark installed, let's run Spark. For that, we need to go into the Spark home, and inside that, we use the command dot slash sbin slash start hyphen all dot sh. Now, what it'll do, it will start the master and the worker. But if you want to start the master separately and the worker separately, you can use start hyphen master dot sh and start hyphen slave dot sh. But generally, I use start hyphen all dot sh as it starts both the master and the worker nodes. Okay, so now to check whether Spark is running or not, we use the command JPS. As you can see here, we have master and worker running along with Hadoop's resource manager, name node, secondary name node, node manager, JPS, and the data node. Now, one more important thing is that after you have made changes to the dot bash RC file, Again, you need to go to the command line and type in source dot bash RC. That will save the path of the notebook as well as PySpark. So as you'll see here, the moment I type PySpark and press enter, PySpark starts running and I'm redirected to the Jupyter notebook. Now what happens is that this Jupyter notebook is communicating with the PySpark environment. So what we can do is go to Python 2. We'll create a new notebook. And we can start writing our programs here as well. But it ultimately comes to your choice whether you want to do all the programming in Shell or you want to continue doing it in the Jupyter Notebook. Personally, I find Jupyter Notebook easy to work with as you have various options here to cut, copy, insert, stop the kernel, and much more. So let's see whether this workbook works or not. So here I'm creating an RDD, which are resilient distributed data sets, which are a key concept in PySpark. So as you can see, the star mark here shows us the process is being done in the background. And if I have a look at the RDD, which I just created, as you can see, PySpark shell is absolutely working fine. So as you can see here in the shell, here we have the notebook, app open and it shows us some messages which are related to the notebook as you can see the last message is saving file at untitled.ipynb which is the extension for a PySpark Jupyter notebook so this is it guys I hope you understood how to install PySpark in your system what all are the dependencies required the hardware and the software requirements now keep in mind that you can use the Jupyter extension it's an optional step if you want to do all the programming in the shell itself, then no need of the Jupyter. But yeah, Jupyter adds a certain level of sophistication to the programming. When it comes to iterative distributed computing, that is processing data over multiple jobs in computation, we need to reuse or reshare the data among multiple jobs. Now in earlier frameworks like Hadoop, there were many problems while dealing with multiple operation jobs. We need to store the data in some intermediate stable distributed storage such as STFS. Now the multiple input output operations make the overall computations job slower and there were replications and serializations which in turn made the process even more slower. Now our goal here was to reduce the number of input output operations through the STFS. This can be only achieved through in-memory sharing data. The in-memory data sharing is 10 to 100 times faster than network or disk sharing. Now RDDs try to solve all these problems by enabling fault-tolerant distributed in-memory computations. So let's understand what are RDDs. Now RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Data Sets. They are considered as the backbone of Apache Spark. As I mentioned earlier, it is one of the first fundamental data structures. Now these are schemaless structures that can handle both structured and unstructured data. The data in RDD is split into chunks based on a key and then dispersed across all the executor nodes. 
arteries are highly resilient that is they are able to recover quickly from any issues as the same data chunks are replicated across multiple executor nodes thus even if executor fails another will still process the data now this allows you to perform your functional calculation against your data set very quickly by harnessing the power of multiple nodes now rdd supports two type of operations namely transformations and actions so basically transformations are the operations which are applied on an RDD to create a new RDD. Now these transformations work on the principle of lazy evaluation. So what does lazy evaluation mean? What it means is that when we call some operation in RDD, it does not execute immediately. Spark maintains the record of the which operation is being called through a dialectic acyclic graph known as DAG. And since the transformations are lazy in nature, so we can execute operations at any time by calling an action on the data hence in lazy evaluation data is not loaded until it is necessary now this helps in optimizing the required calculation and recovery of lost data partition now actions on the other hand are the operations which are applied on an rdt to instruct apache spark to apply computation and pass the result back to the driver now the moment an action is invoked all the computations happen which are in the pipeline this gives us the result and which is stored in the intermediate storage or a distributed file system. Now let's have a look at few of the important transformations and actions. We have certain transformation like map, flat map, filter, distinct, reduce by key, map partition. Do not worry, I'll show you guys exactly how these work and what are the use of all these transformations. And under actions, we have collect, collect as map, reduce, count by key, we have take, we have count by value, and many more. So let's have a look at some of the important features of PySpark RDD. First of all, it's the in-memory computation. RDDs have a provision of in-memory computation, which makes the process even more faster. Now, all the transformations are lazy. As I mentioned earlier, it does not compute the result right away. RDD track lineage information to rebuild lost data automatically. Therefore, it is fault tolerant. Now data can be created or retrieved anytime and once defined its value cannot be changed this refers to the immutability of data partitioning is the fundamental unit of parallelism in PySpark rdd and users can reuse rdd and choose a storage strategy from them which implies for persistence now finally it applies to all the elements in the data set through maps or filter or group by operation which implies that it successfully handles coarse grain operations now there are three ways to create RDDs. One can create an RDD from parallelized collection. It can be created from another RDD, or it can be created from external data sources like SDFS, Amazon S3, HBase, or any database of that sort. So let's create some RDD and work on them. So I'm gonna execute all my practicals in the Jupyter Notebook, but you can execute it on the shell as well. So to create an RDD from parallelized collection, we use the sc.parallelize method. Now sc stands for Spark Context, which can be found under Spark Session. The Spark Session contains a Spark Context, the Streaming Context, and the SQL Context. It has been changed after the release of Spark 2.0 earlier. Spark Context and SQL Context, as well as the Streaming Context, all were distributed separately and had to be loaded separately. Now the sc.parallelize method is the Spark's contest parallelize method to create a parallelize collection. This allows Spark to distribute the data across multiple nodes instead of depending on a single node to process the data. So as you can see here, I am creating a list. So I have assigned Ross as 19, Joey 18, Rachel 16, Phoebe 17, and Monica 20. Now that we have created our RDD, which is my RDD, we will use the take method to return the values to the console which is our notebook and we will also execute an RDD action which is the take so guys if you remember as I told you earlier when an action is invoked all the computations which are lined in the graph or the lineage graph of the transformations which have been performed on the RDD take place all at once so a common approach in PySpark is to use the collect action which returns all the values in your RDD from the spark work nodes to the driver now there are performance implications when working with a large amount of data as this translates to large volume of data being transferred from the spark worker nodes to the driver 
for small amounts of data this is perfectly fine but as a matter of habit you should pretty much always use the take method it returns the first n elements which are being passed to as an argument to the take action instead of the whole data set it is more efficient because it first scans one partition and uses those statistics to determine the number of partitions required to return the result so as i have six elements in my rdd i'm going to use my rdd doc take and as an argument i'm going to pass six so guys as you can see here this is the output of the rdd now another way to take an input of a text file is through sc.text file method and here you need to provide the absolute path of the file which you are going to use so i'm creating a new rdd here and to have a look at the new rdd we are going to use take method to have a look at the first five elements so as you can see we have the first five elements the first one second one third fourth and fifth now we can also take any csv file as an input through sc.txt file so i'll show you guys how it's done so guys here we are going to use the sc.txt file with the absolute path as you can see i am loading a fifa players.csv now there is another argument i have passed here which is minimum partitions now it indicates the minimum number of partitions that make up the rdd the spark engine can often determine the best number of partitions based on the file size but you may want to change the number of partitions for performance reasons and hence the ability to specify the minimum number of partitions here and after that we have used the map transformation now here we use the map function to transform the data from a list of string to a list of lists we are going to use the lambda function now putting the sc.txt file in the map function together allows us to read the text file and split it by the tab delimiter to produce an rdd composed of a parallelized list of list collections so if we have a look at the first three elements of this particular rdd as you can see we have 201 which is round id match id team the initials now to have a look at the number of partitions which we applied in general it takes up the partitions automatically but in case if we want to get the number of partitions for a particular rdd we use the get num partitions method so here we have specified it four so the output should be four i guess yes the output is four and now if you want to have a look at the number of rows in a particular rdd or the number of records in a particular rdd we use the count method here so guys as you can see here we have 37000 number of rows so this was our rdd the sample text file which we took now suppose i want to convert all these data into a low case and and i want to divide all these paragraph into words so for that we create a user defined function so i'll show you how it's done so guys as you can see here we have created a function which will use the dot lower and dot split transformation so we are creating a new rdd here which is the split rdd and we'll pass the new rdd through this function using the map transformation now map is basically used for executing a transformation on each and every element of that particular rdd so if you have a look at the output of the split rdd so guys here you can see all the elements are separated now by individual words and all of them are in lower case right now next what we are going to do is we use the flat map transformation now it is similar to map but the new rdd flattened out all the elements so let us use the flat map transformation and if we have a look at the rdd as you can see the output is flattened it's not vertical it's horizontal in nature which is more easily readable now here i am going to create a stop word rdd which contains a few of the stop words common stop words i'm not using all the stop words here so what my agenda is here is i want to remove all the stop words from this particular rdd which we have here so for that we are going to use the filter transformation we are providing a lambda function here we have defined lambda function x such that x not in stop words and we are creating a new rdd which is rdd1 and we are going to filter out the results from the above created rdd so if you have a look at the output of this new rdd which we are going to create most probably it won't be having the words which are defined in the stop words rdd so as you can see output 13 contains contracts transactions and and the whereas output 15 contains contracts transactions and adi are mentioned in the stop words list so they are not included in the new rdd for that we use the filter transformation now filter can be used in many ways 
mostly it is being used with the help of lambda functions in PySpark RDD. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a filter RDD which will contain all the elements which are starting from C. Here I'm using the lambda function X such that X starts with C. So let's have a look at the output of this new filter RDD. Another important thing to notice here that I'm using the distinct transformation which returns a new RDD containing the distinct elements on the source RDD. So as you can see here, we have control, claim, code, computing, connections, case, car, all the elements starting from C. Now next what I'm going to do is execute a small program of word count. I hope you understand what word count is. The output of this will basically give us count of each particular word. Here I'm taking the output of the first 10 words. So for that I'm using the map function lambda x such that x will be provided with the value 1. Now I'm grouping it by key. I'm using the group by key method here. It is used to group the data according to the particular condition. Now I'm creating another RDD which is RDD frequency which will take the input of RDD group and it will map the values with the sum. It will create the sum of the particular key which will be the word and then I'm again using another transformation of map and then sort by key is given as false. So the output will be in the same format as the input but we'll get the word count as well. So let's have a look at the top 10 words and see what are the count. So as you can see and has 48 counts, D has 38 and so on we can see that they has 7. So the initial RDD one which we created after removing all the stop words contains 660 rows. So now I'm going to use the distinct method here to ask to see what are the distinct elements which will be in RDD2. So if we do RDD2.count it most probably should be less than the RDD1 count or equal to it. So guys it's uh, 440 so 220 stop words were removed from the list. Now suppose I want to have a look at the elements of this RDD2 which I created and I want to see the elements which have the first three letters same as in similar first three letters. I'll show you the output you'll understand. As you can see we have EDG and EDGS which is edges. We have year and years, ALG, algorithm, ROB, robust, SCA, scale. So if we execute it for two we see we have GU guide. GR groundwork, we have growing, gradual, grind log, graphics, gradually. We have such transmission, gains, gained, gain. These are small tricks which will help you to execute your code faster with the help of RDD. Now, next, I'm going to use the sample method. I'm creating a new RDD which is sample RDD and I'm passing the RDD1. And as you can see here, I have two arguments which are false and 0.1. Now, what does this mean? Now false is basically is the width replacement parameter. So suppose I want the output to not have all the replacements. So I'm going to assign false and 0.1 is basically the fraction of data with which we are going to take the output. We are going to take the sample I rather say. So here I'm going to take 10% of the original data RDG1 dot sample. So RDG1 contains 660 rows. So 10% of that must be around 66 or 67 I'll say. So let's collect our sample RDD. So if we take the count of the new sample RDD, as you can see it's 51. It's very much around 66 and as we have used false here, so it's showing us without replacement. So if you have a look at the output of say the sample RDD it will contain a sample from the original RDD to see we have contracts established race. Now next what we are going to learn are some of the functions like join we have reduce reduce by key sort by key we are going to look at unions. So for that I'm creating two RDDs which are the key value pairs. So A has A given as 2 and B as 3. And similarly, we have B containing A value 9, B value 7, and C value 10. So in order to join this RDD, I'm going to create another RDD which is C. And the method to join these two are like I'm going to join A with B. So I'll use A dot join. And in join, I'll give the parameter as B. So if we have a look at the output of C, now here I'm using collect because 
C has very small amount of data in it, but it's advised to use take as well. So looking at the value of C, we can see that A has two values, two and nine, and B has two values, three and seven. Now this is one kind of join. Similarly, you can perform any types of join like left join, left outer join, right outer join. Now here I'm going to create a num RDD, which will take all the numbers from one to 50,000. Now here I'm using the method range to get all the numbers in between one to 50,000. But next we are going to use the reduce, another action which reduces the elements of an RDD using a specified method. So here the method is a lambda function x and y such that the output is x plus y. So this will give us the sum of numbers from 1 to 50,000. So as you can see the sum of numbers is pretty huge. So next I'm going to use the reduce by key method here. I'll show you the importance of that function or I'll say the action. It works in the similar way to the reduce but performs a reduce on a key to key basis. So as you can see the data key data has certain numbers assigned to the alphabets. We have A4, B3, C2, A8, D2, B1, D3 and we have given another parameter which is 4. Now this is the number of parallel tasks to be executed while taking the input into the data underscore key data RDD and as you can see here we have reduced by key we are using the same lambda function. So as you can see in A we have 12 which is the sum of 4 and 8. In D we have 5, D has 2 and 3, C has 2 and B has 4. B has 1 here and 3 here. So in order to save your file you use the save as text file method here. So we are going to save the values of RDD3 into a file called data.txt. Here you need to provide the absolute path where you want to store the data. So let's check out where our data is stored. So it's under desktop. So as you can see here, we have one folder created which is data.txt and inside that we have the part files and the success file. So as you can see, it contains all the elements. So here I'm creating another RDD test to show you the sort by key function and how it works. The sort by key transformation orders the key value RDD by the key and returns an RDD in ascending or descending order. So by default it's ascending but you can also use it to get the output in the descending order. So as you can see I'm using the sc.parallelize and I'm taking the test and I'm using the sort by key true and one. Now true is for ascending. So as you can see I have 1, 3, 2, 5, A, 1, B, 2 and D, 4. 1 comes first, then 2, then A, B and D. That is in the ascending order of the key. So next we are going to learn about the union, how union works. Now the union transformation returns a new RDD, which is the union of the source and the argument RDD, which is being passed. So here we have two RDDs, which are union underscore RDD and union 2, contain certain elements. So if you want to take the union of these two RDD into a new RDD, or just want to see the output of this union, we are going to use the union method here. You can see the syntax is pretty simple here. So as you can see, it created the union of these two RDDs. Similarly, intersection also works in the similar manner. Now next what we are going to learn is the map partitions with index. Now it is similar to map but returns the F function separately on each partition and provides an index to the partition. Now it is useful to determine the data skew within partitions. So for example, I have the function f here which is split index and iterator and yield split index. I have created mpwi which is a map partition with index rdd. It's just a name. It's not necessary to name your rdd like this just for the sake. And if we do the sum, you can see the sum output is 6. So as you can see, we have two rdds here a and b. And I'll show you how intersect works. It's in the same similar fashion as union. Now what it gives is the intersection of these two sets. So now what it will do, it will produce an RDD containing elements found in both RDD. So ideally it should give us the output of 3 and 4 which is common to both RDD. So let's see how it can be implemented. So guys, as you can see the output is 4 comma 3. That is what we expected. Now we are going to use the subtract method. What it will do is subtract the set B, RDD B from RDD A. 
okay so the output should be one and two i guess rather say two and one now another interesting thing to consider is the cartesian product we use the cartesian method here to get the product of rdd a and b so as you can see every element of rdd a has been mapped with every element of rdd b so guys i hope you all understood a lot uh, about the transformations and actions and the operations which can be performed on rdd to get your certain output so guys let's do something interesting now so what we are going to do is here we are going to find the page rank of certain web pages and we are going to use rdd to solve this problem so let's understand what is page rank first so page rank is basically the rank of any page which is being developed by google so the page rank algorithm as you can see here contains a certain formula so the algorithm was developed by serge brin and larry page larry page is the person after which this page rank algorithm has been named and these developers of the page rank algorithm later founded google which is why google uses this page rank algorithm and is one of the best search engines in the world now page rank of a particular web page indicates its relative importance within a group of web pages the higher the page rank the higher up it will appear in the search result now the importance of a page is defined by the importance of all the web pages that provide an outward link to the web page in consideration so for example let's say that a web page x has a very high relative importance then web page x is outbounding to web page y hence web page y will also have a very high importance do you get me if we have a look at the formula here which we have so basically the page rank of a particular page at the particular time is equal to the summation of all the page ranks of the inbound link divided by the number of links on that page now to get a clear idea about this how it works let's take an example here we have four pages we have netflix amazon we have wikipedia and google so initially what we do is assign the value of one to all the pages keep that in mind so according to our formula in the zeroth iteration what we do is to get the page rank we divide it equally among all the number of pages which are there in the network so the page rank at iteration zero for netflix is one by four for amazon it's one by four for wikipedia it's one by four and google is one by four now this is the initial iteration so it doesn't count so from iteration one if you have a look at the formula so suppose we are talking about netflix right so if you look at the formula it says page rank of the inbound link divided by the number of links on the page so netflix has wikipedia coming to inbound the inbound link to netflix is only coming from wikipedia right so we need to consider wikipedia now so the previous page rank of wikipedia is one by four and now we divided by the number of outbound links going from wikipedia which is one going to netflix one to amazon and one to google so it's one by four divided by three which gives us one by twelve okay so let's have a look at the amazon first so amazon has inbound link coming from netflix and wikipedia as well so it will take the summation of netflix and wikipedia so considering netflix we have one by four as the previous iteration divided by the number of outbound links from netflix which is two so 1 by 4 divided by 2 that's 1 by 8 and then we'll add it for wikipedia as well so for wikipedia it is 1 by 4 divided by the number of outbound links which is 1 2 and 3 so it's 1 by 8 plus 1 by 12 which is 2.5 by 12 if you do the calculation so this is how the page rank algorithm works now we'll implement the same using rdd so let's go ahead and get started now so for our example we are having four pages which are a b c and d now consider here d has two inbound links okay so we'll do the summation which is first coming from a and the second one which is coming from b as stated earlier it will be the summation of previous page rank of a divided by the number of outbound going links which are one two and three for a and for b it's one and two so let's see how it can be implemented now step one is creating nested list of web pages with outbound links and initializing ranks 
Okay, so let's get started. So here I've created an RDD which is page links. So for A, the outbounds are B, C, and D. For C, it's B. For B, it's D and C. And for D, it's A and C. So first, initially, we'll assign the page ranks as one, as I mentioned earlier. Now, after creating ranks for the nested list, we have to define the number of iterations for running the page rank. Now we are going to write a function that will take two arguments. The first argument is on our function is the list of web pages and which will provide the outward links to the other web pages. And the second argument is the rank of the web page accessed through the outbound links that are the first argument. Now the function will return contribution to all the web pages in the first argument. So as you can see our first argument on our function list of the web page is the URIs and the second one is the rank. Now the code is very explicable. Our function rank contribution will return the contribution to the page rank for the list of the URIs and which is the first variable and the function will first calculate the number of elements in our list URIs and then it will calculate the rank contribution to the given URIs and finally for each URI the contributed rank will be returned. So let's first create a pair RDD of the link data and then we are going to create the pair RDD for our rank data as well. As you can see, the rank is one. Now, next, what we are going to do is create the number of iterations, which is 20, and we'll have S defined as 0 0.85. Now, the S is known as dampening factor. So let's assign these values. And now it's time for our to write our final loop to update the page rank of every page. So as we have defined the number of iterations as 20 and we have the dampening factor as 0 0.85. So let's compute it. So now if you have a look at the output of the page ranks. So guys, as you can see in the 49th block, there is no actions performed. Okay, so the actions which we are going to perform is in the 50th block. I'd rather say so what I'll do it will run this loop through 20 iterations and to confirm that you can go to the console and you can see here the processes are running. So this will take a certain amount of time based on the number of iterations which we have and this will give us the final output of the ranks I'd rather say. Now so let's investigate our loop first. So first we join the page links RDD to the page ranks RDD via an inner join and then the second line of the for block calculates the contribution to the page rank by using the rank contribution using the rank contribution function we defined previously and the next line we aggregate all the contributions which we have and in the last line we update the rank of each web page by using the map function so as you can see we have the output of b as 0 0.22 d 0 0.24 and a 0 0.25 now the dampening factor also plays an important role here now the value of c must have been even lesser than the value of a b and d so we can say that A has the highest page rank followed by D and then B and the minimum has to be C. Now one thing important to note is that the sum of all the page ranks is always equal to one. So suppose if we look back at our problem there, as you can see in the iteration zero, if we add all the elements here, one by four plus one by four plus one by four plus one by four, that is one. In the iteration one, if we add one by 12 plus 2.5 by 12 plus 4.5 by 12 plus 4 by 12, that will give us one again. And similarly, it's for the iteration two. So more the number of iteration, more will be clearer output and we can get more accurate output here. So I'm sure you might be wondering why exactly we need data frames. Now the concept of data frames comes from the world of statistical software used in empirical research. Data frames are designed for processing large collection of structured or semi-structured data. Observation in Spark data frame are organized under named columns, which helps Apache Spark to understand the schema of a data frame. This helps Spark optimize execution plan on these queries. Now data frames in Apache Spark has the ability to handle petabytes of data. It can handle large amounts of data, which are usually the big data. Now it has support for a wide range of data formats and sources. We'll learn about that later in this video. And finally, last but not the least, it has API support for different languages like Python, R, Scala, Java, which makes it easier to be used by people having different programming backgrounds as well. Now another important feature of DataFrame 
is that the data frame API usually support elaborate methods for slicing and dicing the data. It includes operations such as selecting rows, columns, and cell by name or by number, filtering out rows, and many other operations. Statistical data is very unusual and very messy and contain lots of missing and wrong values. So, a critically important feature of data frame is the explicit management of missing data. Now, let's understand what are data frames. Now, data frames generally refers to tabular data, a data structure representing rows, each of which consists of a number of observations or measurements, which are known as columns. Alternatively, each row may be treated as a single observation of multiple variables. In any case, each row and each column has the same data type, but the row, which is the record data type, may be heterogeneous, while the column data type must be homogeneous. Data frames usually contain some metadata in addition to the data, for example, the column and the row names. Now, data frame is like a 2D data structure, similar to a SQL or a table in a spreadsheet. Now, there are a few important features of data frame that we must know of. First of all, they are distributed in nature which makes it highly available and fault tolerant. Now the second feature is lazy evaluations. Now lazy evaluation is an evaluation strategy which holds the evaluation of an expression until its value is needed. It avoids repeated evaluation and lazy evaluation in Spark means that the execution will not start until an action is triggered and in Spark the picture of lazy evaluation comes when the Spark transformation occurs. Transformations are lazy in nature meaning that when we call some operations, it does not execute immediately. Spark maintains the record of which operation is being called through DAG, which is the Dialectic Acyclic Graph. Since transformations are lazy in nature, so we can execute operations anytime by calling an action on the data. Hence, in lazy evaluation, data is not loaded until it is necessary. Now, there are many advantages of lazy evaluation, like the increased manageability, saving computation, it increases speed, it reduces complexities, and it also provides optimization by reducing the number of queries. Now, finally, we can say that data frames are immutable. Now, by immutable, I mean that it is an object whose state cannot be modified after it is created. But we can transform its values by applying certain transformations, like in RAT as well. Now, a data frame in Apache Spark can be created in multiple ways. It can be created using different data formats, for example, loading data from JSON, CSV, XML file, Parquet files, and it can be also created from an existing RDD, as well as it can be also created from various databases like the Hive database, the Cassandra database, and it can be also created from files which are residing in the file system as well as the SDFS. So let's have a look at the various important classes of data frames and SQL. We have the PySpark SQL.SQL context, which is the main entry point for the data frame and SQL functionality. We have the PySpark SQL.DataFrame, a distributed collection of data grouped into named columns. And we have the PySpark SQL.Column. It is for the column expression in a data frame. Similarly, we have the same for the row. And next, we have the PySpark SQL group data, which is the aggregation methods returned by the data frame dot group by. Now we'll learn more about these important classes later in the video. So let's go ahead and create some data frames. So now I use Jupyter Notebook instead of the PySpark shell as I personally find it easier to work with it. Ultimately, it comes down to your choice. So guys, let's go ahead and start the demo. Now to start the PySpark shell, all you need to type in is PySpark. When you have configured the Spark in your virtual machine or your personal computer, there's few lines of code which you need to add to the bash rc file if you want the jupyter notebook to be integrated with the PySpark. so i've done that i'll show you later how it works so as soon as i enter PySpark, instead of going to the PySpark shell i am redirected to the jupyter notebook so as you can see here guys it has opened the jupyter notebook for me so here i'm going to select a new python 2 file so firstly we'll create an example data of departments and employee so I'll show you how it's done. Now the first and foremost for the data frames is to import the PySpark SQL. Okay, now that the import is successful. So as you can see, I'm creating an employee database with the row function. So basically the rows will have the column name as the first name, last name, email, and the salary. Now next I'm going to create some of the employee data. So as you can see, I've created five employees with the employee data. 
in the same format as given in the first name, last name, email, and salary. And these employee 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all in the format of the employee. Now that we have created employees, let's go ahead and create the departments. Now, as I was saying, Python is very easy and data frames are easy to use. I'll show you how easy it is. Suppose I want to look at the values of the employee 3. All I need to do is just execute the command print and use the employee 3. As you can see, we have a row in which the first name is Muriel, the last name is not specified. We have the email ID and we have the salary. Now, suppose we want to see what was the row value of the employee which we created earlier. As you can see here, if I do the print employee and in square brackets, if I write zero, it's the first name. So basically here I'm using the row function to create the employees and departments. And now we'll create the department with employees instance from the departments and the employees. Now here, as you can see, I didn't even use the curly braces. All I need to do was type in print and department four. Now what was in the department four, which is the ID and the name, the name being the name of the department. We have 901234, which is the ID of the department and the name, department of the name is the development department. Next, we'll create data frames from a list of rows. So guys, this is where it gets a little trickier. Here, as you can see, we have used the spark dot create data frame. This will create a data frame T frame. Now it will contain the departments with employees one and the departments with employees two instance which in turn have the department of one and department two where the employees are employee one, two and five in the department one and we have the employees three and four in department two. So if we display the D frame, we'll see we have the department and inside that we have a string and the name and then we have the employees. It's an array as we have given here, which has the first name, last name, email and the salary. So guys, this is how we create a data frame. Now let's have a look at a FIFA World Cup use case. I hope Argentina Rico was from the Croatia match too. So here we have the data of all the players in the FIFA World Cup. Let's go ahead and load the data. Here we have the data in the CSV format. So I'll show you how it's done. So I'm going to select a new notebook for this one. So as you can see here, we have the FIFA underscore DF and I'm using the function spark.read.csv. This will take the data from the CSV file, which is provided in the file path. And I've set the info schema as true and header as true. Now, if we don't set these values to true, usually the first row of any database has the name of the columns. So what will happen? It will not infer the schema and it will take the first row as the values of the data frame. So as you can see here, the path by default, it takes the STFS path. So in order to give the path of the local file system, you need to put in the file colon and double forward slashes. Now that we have the data frame in FIFA underscore data frame, let's see how this data frame looks. So as you can see here, we have the round ID, the match ID, we have the team initials, the coach name and the team they belong to. We have the lineup, we have the player name, we have the position with place and the event. Now, if you want to print the schema of the particular data frame, all we need to do is use the print schema. And as you can see here, we have the round ID, which is integer, match ID is also integer. Team initials are string and here we have the option of giving the nullable as true. So even if there is no value specified, it will take the value as null. Now suppose next I want to see what all the column in my data frame. We saw that earlier when we used the show command, but another way to do that is using the dot columns. So if you want to know the amount of rows or the number of records in our data frame, all you need to do is skip the name of the data frame and use the count function. So as you can see here, we have almost 37,000 rows. And if you want to take a look at the number of columns, we can manually count it, but when it's not possible, we can use the length of the columns function. So as you can see here, we have the eight columns and we have 37,784 rows. Now suppose we want to describe the summary of a particular column. We use the function describe. Now what it does is that it gives a summary that is the count that is 37,000 which is the number of rows. We get the mean of the particular column which we have given. In our case it's null because it's in the string. We get the standard deviation. We get the minimum. Now here minimum is according to the alphabetical order. So we get a cost to Nelson and maximum is zero. Now similarly we can describe the column position also. As you can see here we have only count of 4,143. The mean and standard deviations are null and the minimum value is C as the captain and the maximum is goalkeeper captain GKC. 
Now suppose you want to know the player name and the coach name in a particular format We just need to use the select option and specify the column names here as you can see We have the player name and the coach name now There's another function in the data frames, which is the filter function Suppose you want to filter out all the players and all the data according to the match ID We use the filter function here and on top of that we use the show function to get our desired results so as you can see here all the data which we have is for the match ID 1096 So it's showing only 20 top rows Now similarly you can see that if you want to filter according to the position of captain Here we have our result and if now I want to check that how many records I have in this particular data frame in which the position is given as captain You can see we have 1510 rows I'd rather say the records where the position is defined as captain it's very similar to SQL. We'll see how we can import SQL queries also later on. Similarly, if we filter it using the position of GK, which is the goalkeeper, you can see we have all the records. Now we can use the filter on more than one parameters also. So here I've taken the position as captain and the event as G40. So here we'll get result of all the players who are paying position as captain and the event they participated was at G40. So there were only two results here now that we have seen filter and select Let's go ahead and see how we can order or group it to order We use the order by function here and here we are ordering it according to the match ID So as you can see the lowest match ID was 25 it usually goes in the increasing order You can also change the parameter of ascending as false to get a desired descending order result Now here I am registering a temporary table of FIFA underscore table for the same data frame which we had earlier which is the FIFA underscore DF and now I'm going to use the SQL queries here So as you can see using the SQL context I've passed the function or as I'd rather say the command which is the select asterisk from FIFA underscore table This will give us the same result as FIFA underscore DF dot show as the same data is now converted into a table which can be used in a SQL context so here in this SQL context we can pass any type of SQL queries that we wish for We'll see that later in our different use case So I hope you guys understood what the basic functions the basic filtering the order by select Show group by all of that can be used in the particular data frames and you also saw how we can pass SQL queries also here I'll show you you just need to invoke the SQL context dot SQL and inside that you can give your SQL queries to be executed on the table rather as say Because the data frame has been converted into this table FIFA underscore table So now that we have seen how to create a data frame using a CSV data file and Also apply some of the functions like selecting ordering filtering and also passing SQL queries to that data frame Let's go ahead with another amazing use case, which is the superhero use case So here we have the data of all the superheroes Nonetheless, I'll show you that one too let me load the data set again. This data set is also in a CSV format So we'll use the same method here to get the data in So as you can see the data is in a CSV format here the superheroes.csv and we'll load the data frame in the same format So guys keep in mind that if the top row of the data set or the data frame Which we are using has all the column names of the data set Please make sure you use the info schema and the header as true so guys as I mentioned earlier you can use the show command to see the contents of the data frame But you can also specify the number of rows So here in case if I have specified show 10 that means that it will show me the top 10 rows of the particular data frame As you can see here we have the serial number starting from 0 to 9 So let's have a look at the columns the columns here We have the serial number we have the name gender we have the eye color of the particular superhero The race to which it belongs alien or is it human? Hungarian cosmic entity we have the hair color we have the height with the publisher and now there are various publisher of these Superheroes like Marvel DC Dark Horse NBC we have the skin color of the hero we have the alignment and we have the weight Now if we use the print schema we can see which all columns have what all data types associated with it Say for example race is a string you can also set nullable as true and false as I mentioned earlier now let's filter out this with using the filter function and let's see how many male superheroes we have We have 505 male superheroes and let's see how many female superheroes we have 200 
So here I'm creating another data frame, which is the race underscore df. Now what it'll do, it'll take the superhero data frame and first it will group by using the race and then it will provide the count to that particular race. So as you can see here, we have the race and associated count to that particular race. It's showing only the top 20 rows, but I guess there are more race of superheroes than we expected. It's not the same as we see in the comic books, is it? Now if we create another data frame here, we are creating the skin underscore df which will take the superhero underscore df data frame and will group by according to the skin color and it will also provide the count of how many superheroes have that particular skin color. So as you can see, we have 21 green superheroes. We have five gray superheroes. We have certain red and golden superheroes, but majority of them are not specified, which is 662. So this is one of the benefits of using a data frame as in you can provide null values too to your data sets. It doesn't provide an error. So till now we have seen group by and order by. Let's go ahead and see the sort function. So I've created weight underscore df, another data frame. I'm going to sort it according to the superhero weight, the, according to the weight column, which is mentioned here. And I'm here I'm using the DESC function, which stands for descending. So as you can see, we have Sasquatch, which is male, eye color red. And if you finally look at the weight, we can see the weight is 900. I mean, whatever be the unit of that weight, it's the highest, it's 900. Now I've created a DC underscore hero to filter out all the heroes from the DC comics. And if I want to see the count of how many heroes are there in the DC comics, we have 215 heroes which are in the DC comics. And similarly, if you want to have a look at the heroes from the Marvel comics, all we got to do is use the filter function along with the publisher as Marvel comics. And same we can do as is Marvel underscore hero dot count. So you can see we have 215 heroes from DC and 388 heroes from Marvel. Now if you want to have a look at all the publishers and get a count on how many heroes are there in the publisher, we're going to use the group by function along with the count function. So you can see here Marvel Comics has 388. This is another way of seeing how many superheroes are there and DC Comics has 215. Personally, I feel that DC has much better storyline than Marvel, but still. As you can see here, Image Comics has 14 and the Null Values has 15. So we can say that Marvel and DC are the two major contenders in the superhero comic market. Now here I'm going to create a table of superheroes using the data frame superhero underscore DF. And similarly, I'll show you to how to pass SQL queries. Now the select asterisk from superhero table that is equivalent to what we use in superhero underscore df dot show. The output of this one is not in a very good sophisticated manner as it was for the data frame. Now if we pass the SQL query as select distinct eye color from superhero table. Let's see what the output of this one will be. Okay, we got the list of all the different eye colors, which are the distinct eye colors. We have yellow without uh, violet, we have gray, green, yellow, brown, indigo, silver, purple. Now suppose I want to see how many actually eye colors are there, distinct eye colors. So we have 23, which we have the distinct eye colors. We saw earlier that maximum weight was 900 pounds or 900 kilos for a particular Sasquatch. As you saw earlier here, you can see this one. So we can get the same result from SQL as well if we choose the select maximum given the name of the column which we want, which is the weight from superhero table. Although it will give us only the maximum record, but it will be the same. So as you can see, the maximum weight is 900 units. So guys, these are some of the functions and the features which you can use in the data frames. And as I mentioned earlier, data frames are very important as they are used for structured and unstructured data. And it can load petabytes of data, which is useful for big data computations. And most importantly, it is used for major slicing and dicing, which is clearing out and cleaning the data set. Now PySpark SQL module is a higher level abstraction over the PySpark core, which is used for processing structured and semi-structured data sets. Using PySpark, you can process the data by making use of the SQL as well as HiveQL, because of which PySpark SQL is gained popularity among database programmers and Apache Hive users as well. Moreover, it provides an optimization API, which means it can read data from various types of sources such as CSV, JSON, and the other file formats or the databases.
Now let me show you how you can apply SQL queries in our data frames to make them more accessible. So let's import the Spark session and also let's import the Spark SQL, which is the SQL context here. So now in order to load our data into a data frame, we use the SQL context here. Earlier in the data frame, we use spark.read.csv. Now here we are going to use the SQL context.read.load. We have provided the infer schema is true and also the header is also true. Now let's load the data into the data frame DF. Now let's have a look at the schema of our database. As you can see here, we have the NYC flights data, which is the New York flight data. We have the year, month, day, departure time, departure delay, arrival time, delay, tail number, flight number. We have the origin, air time, distance, and much more. Now suppose I want to rename a particular column. Uh, suppose I want to rename the column DEST as destination. So for that, we'll use the with column renamed function here. As you can see here in the DF1, if you have a look at the schema of DF1. So as you can see here, the DEST has been changed to destination. Similarly, you can replace the particular column names and now if you want to have a look at the basic statistical information of a particular data frame you need to use the describe command as i mentioned earlier in the data frame if you want to have a look at the summary of a particular column you use the describe and mention the column name but if you want to have a look at the summary of the particular data frame you just need to provide the describe function and you need not mention any column name as you can see here, the output is very haphazard in this manner, but we can beautify it using the pandas library. Now, these libraries are the major reason why people are going for Python and Spark programming rather than Scala or Java, I'd rather say. The availability of these libraries make visualization pretty easier and also machine learning very easy. Now, if you want to select particular columns from our data set, suppose I want to know the flight, origin, destination, and the distance, I'll use the DF2. I'm creating new data frame and I'm using the select query here and also I'm using the distinct function so as to get only the unique values of the flight origin destination and distance now here I'm going to import ASC which stands for ascending and it is used basically in sorting and so now I'm creating another data frame which is sorted DF and I'm passing the data frame to a sort function and then I'm sorting it based on the ascending order of the flight now in flight we have the flight number so our output we'll see in just now so now if we use the sorted df dot show as you can see here in the flight we have the starting it from one the count starts from one now this is again the data set is very huge the number of columns are more so in order to have a look at only the few columns which we saw earlier which was the flight origin destination and distance let me just show you how the cleaner output looks just to have a better understanding of how things work i'm going to use the select query on this sorted data frame we have as you can see here all the flights are starting from flight number one now what i did earlier i'm sending the output of the particular select and the sort query into a sorted data frame 2 i'm creating and as you saw earlier here we have so many duplicate values as in the database is so huge we have so many flights which are originating from jfk and the destination is lax and the distance is 2475 which is fixed so in order to get the distinct values we'll use the distinct command here so just to have a look at the distinct output of the sorted data frame 2 which we created just now so as you can see here the flight number is one but the tail number is different the carrier is different and the air time is also different so let's have a look at the number of rows which we have in our sorted data frame 2 it should be around 3 million, I guess. Yeah, it's 3 million and 36,000. So next what we are going to do is drop the duplicates which are having the carrier and the tail number here. So as you can see here, the tail number and the carrier, we are going to drop all the values which are the similar and the duplicate. We can do this for many columns as we like. So here I'm going to show you for carrier and tail number. And let's now see the count of this particular data frame. So guys, as you can see here, the output is 4,000 rows only. So after just removing just the two columns, the duplicate values of these two columns, we got 4,000. So now if you want to join particular two data frames, 
in SQL, we have the dot join function. I'm creating another data frame which is join underscore df. And I'm, I'm passing the two data frames which are sorted underscore df2 and sorted underscore df, which is just created. And the condition which we are giving here is basis on the flight. We are going to join it on the basis of the flight column. So let's have a look at the output of this join data frame which we have created just now. So as you can see here, we have the join output of the particular two data frames. Now, suppose I want to find the data frame in which our origin is JFK, MCU, and EWR. Apart from the filter function or the select function, we have another function which is where. So it performs the same action. So let's see the output. In our data frame, the origin will only be from JFK, MCO, and EWR. Now, in order to uh, compute the average, we need to first import the average function. And we have created another DF3, which is data frame 3. And we are using the aggregate function with the average of the distance. So, as you can see here, we have got the output of the average distance as 1039. So guys, that's it for PySpark SQL programming. So the next topic in our discussion is PySpark streaming. Now Spark streaming is a scalable fault tolerant streaming system which takes the RDD batch paradigm and Spark streaming processes the data in batches which ultimately speeds up the entire task. Spark streaming receives an input data stream which is internally broken into multiple smaller batches and the size of these batches is based on the batch interval. The Spark engine then processes those batches of the input data to produce a set of batches of processed data. Now, the key abstraction for Spark streaming is the D streams. It represents the small batches that make up the stream of the data. Now, D streams are built on RDDs, which allow Spark developers to work within the same context of RDDs and batches, which is now also applicable to the streaming problems. Now Spark Streaming also integrates with MLLib, which is machine learning. We'll learn about machine learning, the MLLib programming later in this video. It also integrates with SQL, data frames, graphics, which widens your horizon of functionalities. Being a high-level API, Spark Streaming provides fault tolerance exactly one semantics for stateful operators. Spark Streaming has built-in receivers that can take as many as sources as possible. Now these are the basic component of Spark Streaming. As you can see, data can be ingested from many sources like Kafka, Flume, Twitter, Kinesis, or TCP sockets, and many more. And further, this data is processed using the complex algorithm expressed with the high-level functions like map, reduce, join, and window. And finally, the processed data is pushed out to the various file system, databases, and live dashboards. Now, what exactly is machine learning? Machine learning is a method of data analysis that automates analytical model building. Using algorithms that iteratively learn from data, machine learning allows computers to find hidden insights without being explicitly programmed where to look. It focuses on the development of computer programs that can teach themselves to grow and change when exposed to new data. Machine learning uses the data to detect patterns in the data set and adjust programs actions accordingly. Most industries working with large amounts of data have recognized the value of machine learning technology. By gleaning insights from this data, often in real time, organizations are able to work more efficiently or gain an advantage over competitors. Now let's have a look at the various industries where machine learning is being used. Government agencies such as public safety and utilities have a particular need for machine learning. They use it for face detection, security, and fraud detection. Now marketing and sales. Now websites recommending items you might like based on previous purchase use machine learning. They use it to analyze your buying history and promote other items you'd be interested in. Now analyzing data to identify patterns and trends is the key to the transportation industry, which relies on making routes more efficient and predicting potential problems to increase the profitability. Now coming to the financial service, banks and other business in the financial industry use machine learning technology for two key purposes. The first one is to identify important insights in data, and the second one is to prevent fraud. Now coming to healthcare, machine learning is a fast growing trend in the healthcare industry. Thanks to the advent of wearable devices and the sensors that can use data to access a patient's health in the real time. 
Now finally, in the biometric section, the science of establishing the identity of an individual based on the physical, chemical, or the behavior attributes of the person is one of the major key advantages of machine learning in the biometrics area. Now let's have a look at typical machine learning life cycle. Any machine learning life cycle is divided into two phases. The first one is training and the second one is testing. Now for training, we use the 70 to 80% of the data and the rest the remaining data is used for testing purposes. So first of all, we train the data and we use any particular algorithm to train the data and using that algorithm, we produce a model. Now after that, we have produced our model. Now the remaining 20 to 30% of the data is used for the testing purposes. We pass this data to the model and we find out the accuracy of that model with certain tests. Now this is what a typical machine learning life cycle looks like. Now there are three major categories of machine learning as I mentioned earlier which are supervised reinforcement and the unsupervised learning. So let's understand these terms in detail starting from supervised learning. Now supervised learning algorithms are trained using labeled examples such as input where the desired output is known. The learning algorithm receives a set of inputs along with the corresponding correct outputs and the algorithm learns by comparing its actual output with the correct output to find errors. It then modifies the model accordingly through methods like classification, regression, predicting, and gradient boosting. Supervised learning uses patterns to predict the values of each label on additional unlabeled data. It is called supervised learning because the process of an algorithm learning from the training data set can be thought of as a teacher supervising the learning process. Now, supervised learning is majorly divided into two categories namely classifications and regression algorithms. Regression is the problem of estimating or predicting a continuous quantity. What will be the value of the S&P 500 one month from today? How tall will a child be as an adult? How many of the customers will leave for a competitor this year? These are examples of the questions that would fall under the umbrella of regression. Now coming to classification. Classification deals with assigning observation into discrete categories rather than estimating continuous quantities. In the simplest case, there are two possible categories. This case is known as binary classification. Many important questions can be framed in the terms of binary classification. Will a given customer leave us for a competitor? Does a given patient have cancer? Does a given image contain a dog or not? Now classification mainly consists of classification trees, support vector machines, and random forest algorithms. Whereas regression consists of linear regressions, decision trees, Bayesian networks, and fuzzy classification. Now there are other algorithms like artificial neural network programming and gradient boosting which also comes under supervised learning algorithms. Now next we have reinforcement learning. Now reinforcement learning is learning how to map situations to actions so as to maximize a reward and often used for robotics, gaming and navigation. With reinforcement learning, the algorithm discovers through trial and error which actions yield the greatest rewards and the algorithm provides information about whether the answer is correct or not. But does not tell how to improve it. The agent is the learner or decision maker whose job is to choose actions that maximize the expected reward over a given amount of time. Actions are what the agent can do and the environment is everything the agent interacts with. The algorithm whose ultimate goal is to acquire as much as numerical reward as possible gets penalized each time its opponent scores a point and gets rewarded each time it manages to score a point against the opponent. It uses this feedback to update its policy and gradually it filters out all the actions that lead to penalty. Reinforcement learning is useful in cases where the solution space is enormous or infinite and typically applies in cases where the machine learning can be thought of as an agent interacting with its environment. Now there are many reinforcement learning algorithms. Few of them are the Q-learning. We have the SARSA, which is the state action reward state action. We have deep Q network. We have the deep deterministic policy gradient, which is DDPG. And finally, we have the TRPO, which is the trust region policy optimization. Now, the last category of machine learning is unsupervised learning. So as I mentioned earlier, supervised learning tasks find patterns where we have a data set of the right answers to learn from. Whereas in case of unsupervised learning, tasks find patterns where we do not. This may be because the right answers are unsolvable or infeasible to obtain or maybe for a given problem there isn't even a right answer per se. A large subclass of unsupervised task is the problem of clustering. Clustering refers to grouping observation together in such a way that members of a common group are similar to each other and different from members of other groups. A common application here is in marketing where we wish to identify segments of customers or prospects with similar preferences or buying habits. 
A major challenge in clustering is that it is often difficult or impossible to know how many clusters should exist or how the cluster should look. Unsupervised learning is used against data that has no historical labels. The system is not told the right answer. The algorithm must figure out what's being shown. The goal is to explore the data and find some structure within. Unsupervised learning works well on transactional data and these algorithms are also used to segment text topics, recommend items and identify data outliners. Now there are majorly two classifications of unsupervised learning. One is clustering as I discussed earlier and the other one is dimensionality reduction which includes topics like principal component analysis, tensor decomposition, multidimensional statistics and random projection. So now that we have understood what is machine learning and what are its various types of machine learning, let's have a look at the various component of Spark ecosystem and understand how machine learning plays an important role here. Now as you can see here, we have a component named MLlib. Now PySpark MLlib is a machine learning library. It is the wrapper over the PySpark core to do analysis using machine learning algorithms. It works on distributed systems and is scalable and we can find implementation of classification, clustering, linear regression and other machine learning algorithms in PySpark MLlib. We know that PySpark is good for iterative algorithms. Using iterative algorithms, many machine learning algorithms have been implemented in PySpark MLlib. Apart from PySpark's efficiency and scalability, PySpark MLlib APIs are very user friendly. Software libraries which are defined to provide solution for the various problems come with their own data structure. These data structures are provided to solve a specific set of problems with efficient options. PySpark MLlibs comes with many data structures including dense vectors, sparse vectors and a local and distributed matrix. So the major MLlib algorithms include MLlib, we have clustering, we have frequent pattern matching, we have linear algebra, we have collaborative filtering, we have classification and finally we have linear regression. Now let's see how we can leverage MLlib to solve our few problems. So let me explain this use case to you. A system was hacked but the metadata of each session that the hackers used to connect their servers were found. Now these included features like session connect time, the bytes transfer, we have the Kali trace used, we have certain data like servers corrupted, pages corrupted, the location and we have the WPM typing speed. Now there are three potential hackers two confirmed hackers and one not yet confirmed. The forensic engineers know that the hacker trades off attacks, meaning they should each have roughly the same amount of attacks. For example, if there were 100 attacks, then in a two hacker situation, each would have 50 attacks and in a three hacker situation, each would have 33 attacks. So here we are going to use clustering. So let's see how we can use clustering to find out how many hackers were involved. So today I'm going to use the Jupyter Notebook to do all my programming. Let me just open a new Python to Jupyter Notebook. So first of all, what we are going to do is import all the required libraries and initiate the Spark session. Now next what we are going to do is read the data using the spark.read method. Now here we are doing spark.read.csv as our data set is in CSV format and we have given header and info schema as true. Now here the default location what it takes is SDFS when we do the spark.read. So in order to change the default location to your local file system, you need to provide file colon and two forward slashes and then provide the absolute part of the data file which we are going to read. Now let's have a look at the first record of the data frame and also the summary of the data set. Now to have a summary of the data set, we use the describe function here. Now the output of this one is very haphazard. So if we want to have a look at the names of the columns which we have here, we just need to use the data set dot columns. So as you can see, we have the session connect time. We have the bytes transferred. We have Kali trace used, servers corrupted, pages corrupted, the location and the WPM typing speed. Now WPM stands for words per minute. Now next what we are going to do is import the vectors and the vector assembler library. Now these are all machine learning libraries which we are going to use. Now what vector assembler does is take a set of columns and define a particular feature. So our features consist of the session time, the bytes transfer, the Kali trace used. We have the servers corrupted, the pages corrupted and the WPM typing speed. One thing to note down is that the feature selection is based on us. So whatever we the feature selection, if our model is not predicting the right output, we can change the features accordingly to get the desired output. Now I've created a VEC underscore assembler which will take all the above defined attributes 
and based on that it will provide us the feature column now what next we are going to do is make our final data and we'll use vector assembler and transform it on the data set which we have now next what we'll do is we'll import the standard scale library now centering and scaling happen independently on each feature by computing the relevant statistics on the samples in the training set mean and standard deviation are then sorted to be used on the later data using the transform method standardization of the data set is a common requirement for many machine learning estimators they might behave badly if the individual feature do not more or less look like standard normally distributed data now let's compute the summary statistics by fitting the standard scalar and then let's normalize each feature to have a unit standard deviation now finally we have the cluster final data it's time for us to find out whether there were two or three hackers so for that we are going to use k-means here so i've created k-means 3 and k-means 2 k-means 3 will have all the features with the k value as 3 and the k-means 2 will have the features column which are the scaled features with the k value as 2 now what we'll do is create models for these both k-means 3 and k-means 2 variables we are going to fit it into the cluster final data now w triple s e stands for within set sum of squared errors so let's have a look at the values of these for the model which has k equals 3 that is three clusters and for the model which has k equals 2. now for k equals 3 the set sum of squared errors is 434 and for k equals 2 it is 601. now let's have a look at the values of k starting from 2 to 9 to have a look at the values of within set sum of squared errors as you can see the values are getting lower and lower that means the probability of the number of hackers being more than 3 and 4 is very less as you can see for k equals 8 is 198 now the last key fact the engineer mentioned was that the attacks should be evenly numbered between the hackers let's check with the transformation and prediction column that the result for this now grouping by prediction we'll see as you can see if we have the prediction of three hackers the count is 167 79 and 88 which is not evenly distributed so if we have a look at the data for k equals 2 with the model k2 and do the prediction so guys as you can see here the count is evenly distributed this means that only two hackers were involved the clustering algorithm created two equal side cluster with k equals 2 and the count being 167 for each one of them so this is one way through which we can find out how many hackers were involved using k-means clustering so let's move forward with our second use case which is the customer churn prediction now customer churn prediction is big business it minimizes customer deflection by predicting which customers are likely to cancel a subscription to a service though originally used within the telecommunication industry it has become common practice across banks isps insurance firms and the other verticals the prediction process is heavily data driven and often utilizes advanced machine learning techniques in this post we'll take a look at what type of customer data are typically used to do some preliminary analysis of the data and train rate churn prediction models all with PySpark and its machine learning framework so let's have a look at the story of this use case now a marketing agency has many customers that use their service to produce ads for the client and customers they've noticed that they have quite a few bit of churns in the clients they basically randomly assign account managers right now but they want you to create a machine learning model that will help predict which customers will churn so that they can correctly assign the customers most at risk to churn an account manager luckily they have some historical data so can you help them out do not worry i'll show you how to help them so we need to create a classification algorithm here that will help classify whether or not a customer churned then the company can test this against the incoming data for future customers to predict which customers will churn and assign them an account manager so let's import the libraries first which we need so here we are going to use logistic regression to solve this method now the data is saved as customer underscore churn dot csv so we'll use the spark dot read method here to read the historic data and then we'll have a look at the schema of the data and understand what exactly are we dealing with now to understand the schema of any particular data frame or the data we use the print schema method 
so as you can see here guys we have name age we have the total purchase we have account manager years the number of sites onboard date location company and the churn so let's have a look at the data so as you can see here we have data of 900 customers here so I've used the count method to get exactly the number of rows to see how much we are dealing with now let's load up the test data as well and now have a look at the schema of this data so as you can see the test data is also in the same format as the training data next what we are going to do is import the vector assembler library now since I've already imported the vector assembler library here as you can see earlier in this we have done from pyspark.ml.feature import vector assembler so I'm not going to import it again as it will show us some error now firstly we must transform our data using the vector assembler function to get to a single column where each row of the data frame contains a feature vector now this is a requirement for the regression API and ML lib so as you can see here I'm using age the total purchase the account manager the years and the number of sites I must say it's dependent on the user that is creating the model so say that this model is not giving us the output as we want or we require so we'll change the parameters of the input columns now here what we are doing we are creating an output underscore data which is a data frame which will contain the data of the input data which has been converted using all these input columns or the features and have a single output of the column named features so let's have a look at the schema of this new output data so guys as you can see here all the columns are the same except for the last one and the last we have an additional feature column and it's a vector so this will help us in the prediction of the customer churn now in order to have a look at what we are dealing here let's take a look at the output of the first element so as you can see here in the last we have the features which is a dense vector containing all the five values of the column which is 42 age 1166 which is the total purchase we have 0.0, .0 which is account manager we have 10.2 years and we have the number of sites which is eight so now what we are going to do is create our final data we'll use this output data which we have from the vector assembler and what we'll do is only select the features and the churn so if you have a look at the final data so as you can see here we have only two columns which are the features and the churn so now what we are going to do is split our data into training and testing data for now we are going to use the random split method and we are dividing it in the ratio of 70 to 30. now what we are going to do is create our logistic regression model and now we are going to use the column churn for the label so now let's train the model using our training data which is just now created from our final data so let's have a look at the summary of the model which we just created so guys, as you can see here we have the churn the prediction we have the main standard deviation the minimum and the maximum value now that we have created our model let's use it to get the value of the evaluator on the raw prediction data now for that we need to first import the binary classification evaluator we are creating a data frame predictions in which we'll fit the test data into the model and evaluate using the binary classification evaluator now when we have a look at the output data we can see on the left hand side we have the features then we have the churn then we have the raw prediction according to our model then we have the probability and finally the prediction so let's use the evaluator which has the binary classification evaluator it will take the prediction column and the label column churn and tell us how accurate is our model so as you can see it's 77% accurate so earlier I loaded the test data I'll show you here you can see we have the new customers.csv so we use the original data split it into 70 to 30 ratio then we created a model and train it using our training data and then tested it using the testing data so now we'll use the incoming new data which is the new customers and see if our model is fit or not now again we are going to use the assembler the vector assembler here now we have created a data frame results in which it will take the logistic regression model and transform it using our the new test data and this new test data also contains the features column because we used the vector assembler just before that so if you have a look at the results it's very haphazard here I'll show you another format just hang on a second so what we are going to do is select the company and the predictions just to see how it's working so as you can see the Canon Benson prediction is true 
Baron Robertson prediction is true. The Sexton Golden is also true, and the Park Robinson also. So guys, as you can see, our model was 77% accurate. Now we can play along with the features column to see if our model produces a more accurate output. So in our case, if we are satisfied with the 77% ratio of the model being true, the prediction being true, then it's fine. But then again, we can change it according to our preferences. In a world where data is being generated at an alarming rate, the correct analysis of the data at the correct time can be very useful. Now, one of the most amazing framework to handle big data in real time and perform analysis is Apache Spark. And if we talk about the programming languages being used nowadays for different purposes, I'm sure Python will top this chart as it is being used almost everywhere. So, talking about the features of Apache Spark, starting off with the most important feature that is speed. It is almost 100 times faster than the traditional data processing tools and frameworks. It has powerful caching. The simple programming layer provides powerful caching and disk persistent capabilities. Now coming to deployment, Apache Spark can be deployed through Mesos or Hadoop via Yarn or via Spark's own cluster. The most important feature that helps Spark achieve the fast speed in real-time computation and low latency is the use of in-memory computation, the lazy evaluation of transformations, the dyadic acyclic graphs, and much more. Now Spark is polyglot, which means it can be programmed in various languages like Python, Scala, Java, and R. And it is one of the reasons why Apache Spark has taken over machine learning and exploratory analysis. Now let's have a look at the various companies that use Apache Spark. Here we have Yahoo, Alibaba, Nokia, Netflix, NASA, Databricks, which is the official enterprise distributor of Apache Spark. We have TripAdvisor and we have eBay. So you can see Spark has been used in the industry a lot. Now let's have a look at the various industry use cases. First of all, starting with healthcare. As healthcare providers look for novel ways to enhance the quality of healthcare, Apache Spark is slowly becoming the heartbeat of many healthcare applications. Many healthcare providers are using Apache Spark to analyze patient records along with the past clinical data to identify which patients are likely to face health issues after being discharged from the clinic. This helps hospitals prevent hospital readmittance as they can deploy home healthcare services to the identified patient, saving on costs for both the hospitals and the patient. Apache Spark is used in genome sequencing to reduce the time needed to process genome data. It took several weeks to organize all the chemical compounds with genes, but now with Apache Spark on Hadoop, it just takes few hours. Now coming to finance, banks are using Apache Spark to access and analyze the social media profiles, call recordings, complaint logs, emails, the forum discussion to gain insights which can help them make right business decisions for credit risk assessment, targeted advertising, and customer segmentation. One of the financial institutions that has retail banking and brokerage operations is using Apache Spark to reduce its customer churn by 25%. The financial institution has divided the platforms between retail, banking, trading, and investment. However, the bank wants a 360 degree view of the customer regardless of whether it is a company or an individual. To get the consolidated view of the customer, the bank uses Apache Spark as the unifying layer. Now, Spark helps the bank automate analytics with the use of machine learning by accessing the data from each repository for the customers. Now, talking about media, Apache Spark is used in the gaming industry to identify patterns from the real-time in-game events and respond to them to harvest lucrative business opportunities like target advertising, auto-adjustment of gaming levels based on complexity, player retention, and many more. Now, Conviva is another company averaging about 4 million videos per month it uses Apache Spark to reduce customer churn by optimizing video streams and managing live video traffic, thus maintaining a consistently smooth, high-quality viewing experience. Now you all might have heard about Netflix. Netflix uses Apache Spark for real-time stream processing to provide online recommendation to its customer. Streaming devices at Netflix send events which capture all member activities and play a vital role in personalization. It processes 450 billion events per day which flow to the server-side application and are then directed to Apache Kafka. Now coming to the retail and e-commerce industry, one of the largest e-commerce platform, Alibaba, runs some of the largest Apache Spark shops in the world in order to analyze hundreds of petabytes of data on its e-commerce platform. Some of the Spark jobs that perform feature extraction on image data run for several weeks. Millions of merchants and users interact with Alibaba e-commerce platform each of this interaction is represented as a complicated large graph 
and Apache Spark is used for fast processing of sophisticated machine learning on this data. Now eBay also uses Apache Spark to provide targeted offers, enhance customer experience, and optimize overall performance. Apache Spark is leveraged at eBay through Hadoop Yarn. Yarn manages all the clusters resources to run the generic task and eBay Spark users leverage the Hadoop cluster in the range of 2000 nodes, 20,000 cores and 100 TB of RAM through Yarn. Now finally coming to the travel industry, TripAdvisor, a leading travel website that helps plan a perfect trip, is using Apache Spark to speed up its personalized customer recommendation. TripAdvisor uses Apache Spark to provide advice to millions of travelers by comparing hundreds of websites to find the best hotel prices for its customers. The time taken to read and process the reviews of the hotels in a readable format is done with the help of Apache Spark. Now we all know Uber. Every day this multinational online taxi dispatch company gathers terabytes of event data from its mobile users. By using Kafka, Spark Streaming and SDFS to build a continuous ETL pipeline, Uber can convert unstructured event data into structured data as it is collected and then use it for further and more complex analysis. So as I was talking about Spark being a polyglot earlier, it basically means that programming in Spark can be done in various languages like Scala, Python and R. Now you may ask which one should I go or choose to begin with. So Spark was developed in Scala that you should know. It was the default language in which Spark was developed. It is very similar to Java. But the recent emergence of data analytics and machine learning has made it difficult for Scala to keep up. So instead Spark came up with a Python API to use Python. So let's have a look at the reasons why one should go for Python to begin with. Firstly, it is easy to learn. For programmers, Python is comparatively easy to learn because of its syntax and standard libraries. Moreover, it is dynamically typed language, which means RDDs can hold objects of multiple types. Now we'll discuss more about RDDs coming up in this video. Now it's portable and it can be used with various operating systems like Windows, Solaris, Linux, we have the BOS, PlayStation and the Mac OS. And lastly, Scala does not have sufficient data science tools and libraries like Python for machine learning and natural language processing. Spark MLlib, the machine learning library, has only fewer ML algorithms, but they are ideal for big data processing. In summary, we can say that Scala lacks good visualization and local data transformation tools along with highly used machine learning libraries. Now, Edureka, as we know, provide a detailed and comprehensive training on Apache Spark in Python, that is the PySpark Developer Certification Training. Now this course is designed to provide knowledge and skills to become a successful Spark developer using Python. You will get in-depth knowledge of concepts such as Hadoop Distributed File System, the Hadoop Cluster, Flume, Scoop, Apache Kafka. You'll learn about the APIs and the libraries which Spark offers such as Spark Streaming, MLlib, Spark SQL, and this PySpark developer course is an integral part of a big data developer's career path. This course is designed to provide knowledge and skills to become a successful Hadoop and Spark developer and would help to clear the Spark and Hadoop developer, which is the CCA 175 examination. This course has in total 12 modules with one bonus module and it focuses on Cloud Data's Hadoop and Spark developer certification training. Now coming to module one, which is the introduction to big data Hadoop and Spark. In this model, you will understand big data, the limitation of existing solutions for big data problems, how Hadoop solves the big data problem, the Hadoop ecosystem, Hadoop architecture, SDFS, rack awareness and replication. You will learn about the Hadoop cluster architecture, important configuration files in Hadoop cluster, and you will also get an introduction to Spark, why it is used and understanding the difference between batch processing and real time processing. Now coming to model two, which is introduction to Python for Apache Spark. At the end of this model, you'll be able to define Python, understand operands and expressions. You'll be able to write your first Python program, understand command line parameters and flow control. You will understand how to take an input from the user and perform operations on it. And you'll also learn about numbers, strings, tuples, less dictionaries and sets. Now coming to module three, which is basically the functions, oops, modules, error and exceptions in Python. In this module, you will learn how to create generic Python scripts, how to address the errors and exceptions in the code, and finally, how to extract and filter content using the regex. Now, module four is deep dive into Apache Spark framework. In this module, you will understand Apache Spark in depth, and you will also learn about the various Spark components. You will be creating and running various Spark applications, and at the end, you will learn how to perform data ingestion using Scoop. Now, coming to module five, which is playing with Spark RDDs. 
In this model, you will learn about Spark RDDs, which are the resilient distributed data sets and other RDD related manipulations for implementing business logistics, like the transformations, actions, and the functions performed on RDD. Moving on to model 6, which is the data frames in Spark SQL. In this model, you will learn about Spark SQL, which is used to process structured data with SQL queries. You will learn about the data frames and the data sets in Spark SQL, along with different kind of SQL operations performed on the data frames. You will also learn about the Spark and Hive integration. Now, module 7, which is machine learning using Spark MLlib. In this module, you will learn about why machine learning is needed, different machine learning techniques and algorithms, and their implementation using the Spark MLlib. Now, each module is deep dive into Spark MLlib. In this model, you will be implementing various algorithms supported by a machine learning library, which is the MLlib, such as linear regression, decision tree, random forest, and many more. Now coming to model 9, which is understanding Apache Kafka and Apache Flume. In this model, you will understand Kafka and Kafka architecture. Afterwards, you will go through the details of Kafka cluster and you will also learn how to configure different types of Kafka cluster. At last, you will see how messages are produced and consumed using Kafka APIs in Java. You will also get an introduction to Apache Flume, its basic architecture, and how it is integrated with Apache Kafka for event processing. Now, model 10 is Apache Spark Streaming. In this model, you will work on Apache Spark Streaming, which is used to build scalable fault-tolerant streaming application. You will learn about these streams and the various transformations performed on the streaming data. You will get to know about commonly used streaming operators such as sliding window operator and the stateful operators. Now, model 11 is Apache Spark Streaming Data Sources. In this model, you will learn about the different streaming data sources such as Kafka and Flume, and at the end of this module, you will also be able to create a Spark streaming application. Now, module 12 is the in-class project. Now, this project will comprise of all that we have learned till now. That is Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, Flu, and much more. And as a bonus, we have another module, which is the graphics. In this module, you will be learning the key concepts of Spark graphics, programming concepts, and operations along with the different graphics algorithms and their implementations. Now that we have seen the training structure offered by Adoreka, let's understand what exactly PySpark is. Now, Apache Spark is an open source cluster computing framework for real time processing developed by Apache Spark Foundation. And PySpark is nothing but the Python API for Apache Spark. Now, let's have a look at the various components of the Spark ecosystem. The core engine of the entire Spark framework provides utilities and architecture for other components. Spark Streaming enables analytical and interactive apps for live streaming data. The MLlib, which is machine learning library of Spark, it is built on top of Spark to support the various machine learning algorithms. Graphics Computational Engine, which is similar to Graph, combines data parallel and graph parallel concepts. Spark R is the package for R language to enable R user to leverage Spark power from the R shell. Now, finally, we have the PySpark. The API developed to support Python as a programming language for Spark. Now, PySpark shell links the Python API to the Spark core and initializes the Spark context. The Spark context is the heart of any Spark application. Spark context sets up internal services and establishes a connection to a Spark execution environment. The Spark context object in the driver program coordinates all the distributed processes and allows resource allocation. The cluster managers provides executors which are JVM processes with logic. Spark context object sends the application to the executors, and then Spark context executes these tasks in each executors. Now, when you have installed Spark on your system, just by typing PySpark, you can enter the Spark shell, and it looks something like this. Just make sure that all the demons of Spark are running in the background. So let's take the first question and look into the answer like how commonly this covered what is apache spark and spark it's with apache foundation now it's an open source it's a cluster computing framework for real-time processing so three main keywords over here apache spark it's an open source project it's used for cluster computing and for in-memory processing along with real-time processing it's going to support in-memory computing so there are lots of projects which supports cluster computing along with that spark differentiates itself by doing the in-memory computing. It's a very active community and out of the Hadoop ecosystem technologies, Apache Spark is very active. Multiple releases we got last year. It's a very active project among the Apache projects. Basically, it's a framework 
client support in memory computing and cluster computing and you may face this specific question how spark is different than MapReduce or how you can compare it with the MapReduce. MapReduce is the processing methodology within the Hadoop ecosystem and within Hadoop ecosystem we have HDFS Hadoop distributed file system. MapReduce going to support distributed computing and how Spark is different. So how we can compare Spark with the MapReduce. In a way this comparison going to help us to understand the technology better but definitely like we cannot compare these two or two different methodologies by which it's going to work. Spark is very simple to program, but MapReduce, there is no abstraction or the sense like all the implementations we have to provide. And interactivity, it has an interactive mode to work with in Spark. A MapReduce, there is no interactive mode. There are some components like Apache Pig and Hive, which facilitates us to do the interactive computing or interactive programming. And Spark supports real-time stream processing. And to precisely say within Spark, the stream processing is called near real-time processing. There's nothing in the world is real-time processing. It's near real-time processing. It's going to do the processing in micro batches. I'll cover in detail when we are moving on to the streaming concept. I are going to do the batch processing on the historical data in MapReduce. When I say stream processing, I'll get the data that is getting processed in real-time and do the processing and get the result, either store it or publish it to public community, we will be doing it. Latency wise, MapReduce will have very high latency because it has to read the data from hard disk. But Spark, it will have very low latency because it can reprocess or use the data already cached in memory. But there's a small catch over here. In Spark, first time when the data gets loaded, it has to read it from the hard disk, same as MapReduce. So once it is read, it will be there in the memory. So Spark is good whenever we need to do a iterative computing. So Spark, whenever you do iterative computing again and again, do the processing on the same data, especially in machine learning, deep learning, all we will be using the iterative computing. Here Spark's performance much better. You will see the Spark performance improvement 100 times faster than MapReduce. But if it is one time processing and fire and forget that type of processing, Spark relatively it may be the same latency you will be getting it than MapReduce, maybe like some improvements because of the building block or Spark, that's the RDD. We may get some additional advantage. So that's the key feature or the key comparison factor of Spark and MapReduce. Now let's get on to the key features, explain key features of Spark. We discussed about the speed and performance. It's going to use the in-memory computing. So speed and performance wise, it's going to much better when we do iterative computing and it's a polygot. In the sense, the programming language to be used with the Spark, it can be any of these languages. It can be Python, Java, R, R Scala. We can do programming with any of these languages. And data formats to give us an input, we can give any data formats like JSON, Parquet, any data formats we can give that as an input. And the key selling point with the Spark is its lazy evaluation. In the sense, it's going to calculate the DAG cycle, directed acyclic graph, DAG, we call that as a DAG. It's going to calculate what all steps needs to be executed to achieve the final result. So we need to give all the steps as well as what final result I want. It's going to calculate the optimal cycle or optimal calculation. What all steps needs to be calculated or what all steps needs to be executed. Only those steps it will be executing it. So basically it's a lazy execution. Only if the results needs to be processed, it will be processing that specific result. And it supports real-time computing. It's through Spark Streaming. There is a component called Spark Streaming which supports real-time computing. And it gels with the Hadoop ecosystem very well. It can run on top of Hadoop Yarn or it can leverage the HDFS to do the processing. So when it leverages the HDFS, the Hadoop cluster container can be used to do the distributed computing as well as it can uh, leverage the resource manager to uh, manage the resources. So Spark can gel with the HDFS very well as well as it can leverage the, the resource manager to share the resources as well as data locality it can leverage. Data locality it can do the processing near to the data where data is located within the HDFS. And it has a fleet of machine learning algorithms already implemented right from clustering, classification, regression, all those logic already implemented and machine learning it's achieved using MLlib within Spark. And there is a component called graphics which supports graph theory. So we can 
solve the problems using graph theory, using the component graph x within the Spark. So these are the things we can consider as the key features of Spark. So when you discuss with the installation of the Spark, you may come across this yarn. What is yarn? Do you need to install Spark on all nodes of yarn cluster? So yarn is nothing but yet another resource negotiator. That's the resource manager within the Hadoop ecosystem. So that's going to provide the resource management platform. Yarn going to provide the resource management platform across all the clusters. And Spark, it's going to provide the data processing. So wherever the resource being used, that location, the Spark will be used to do the data processing. And of course, yes, we need to have Spark installed on all the nodes where Spark clusters are located. That's basically we need those libraries. And additional to the installation of Spark in all the worker nodes, we need to increase the RAM capacity on the worker machines as well. Your Spark going to consume huge amount of memory to do the processing. It will not do the MapReduce way of working. Internally, it's going to generate the DAG cycle and do the processing on top of YARN. So YARN at the high level, it's like resource manager or like an operating system for the distributed computing. It's going to coordinate all the resource management across the fleet of servers. On top of it, I can have multiple components like Spark, Taze, Giraffe. So Spark, especially, it's going to help us to achieve in-memory computing. So Spark Yarn is nothing but it's a resource manager to manage the resource across the cluster. On top of it, we can have Spark. And yes, we need to have Spark installed in all the nodes on where the Spark Yarn cluster is used. And also additional to that, we need to have the memory increased in all the worker nodes. The next question was like this, what file system does Spark support? When I say file system, when we work in an individual system, we will be having a file system to work within that particular operating system. But in a distributed cluster or in a distributed architecture, we need a file system with which, where we can store the data in a distributed mechanism. Hadoop comes with a file system called HDFS. It's called Hadoop Distributed File System, where data gets distributed across multiple systems, and it will be coordinated by two different types of components called name node and data node. And Spark, it can use this HDFS directly. So you can have any files in HDFS and start using it within the Spark ecosystem. And it gives another advantage of data locality. When it does the distributed processing, wherever the data is distributed, the processing could be done locally to that particular machine where data is located. And to start with, as a standalone mode, you can use the local file system as well. So this could be used especially when we are doing the development or any POC, we can use the local file system. And Amazon Cloud provides another file system called S3, Simple Storage Service. We call that as the S3. It's a block storage service. This can also be leveraged or used within Spark for the storage. And a lot other file system also it supports. There are some file systems like Alexo, which provides in-memory storage. So we can leverage that particular file system as well. So we have seen all features, what all uh, functionalities available within Spark. We are going to look at the limitations of using Spark. Of course, every component, when it comes with a huge power and advantage, it will have its own limitations as well. So this question illustrates some limitations of using Spark. Spark utilizes more storage space compared to Hadoop. When it comes to the installation, it's going to consume more space. But in the big data world, that's not a very huge constraint because storage cost is not very great or very high in a big data space. And developer needs to be careful while running the apps in Spark. The reason because it uses in-memory computing. Of course, it handles the memory very well. But if you try to load a huge amount of data in the distributed environment, and if you try to do join, when you try to do join with in the distributed world, the data are going to get transferred over the network. Network is really a costly resource. So the plan or design should be such a way to reduce or minimize the data transfer over the network. And however the way possible, with all possible means, we should facilitate distribution of the data over multiple machines. The more we distribute, the more parallelism we can achieve and the more results we can get. And cost efficiency, if you try to compare the cost, how much cost involved to do a particular processing, take any unit in terms of processing 1 GB of data with uh, say like 5 iterative processing. If you compare cost-wise in-memory computing always it's costlier because memory, it's 
relatively com costlier than the storage. So that may act like a bottleneck and we cannot increase the memory capacity of the machine beyond some limit. So we have to grow horizontally. So when we have the data distributed in memory across the cluster, of course the network transfer, all those bottlenecks will come into picture. So we have to strike the right balance, which will help us to achieve the uh, in-memory computing. Whatever the in-memory computing requires, it will help us to achieve. And it consumes huge amount of data processing compared to Hadoop. And Spark, it performs better when user does uh, iterative computing. Because like for both Spark and the other technologies, it has to read data for the first time from the hard disk or from other data source. And Spark performance is really better when it reads the data or do, does the processing when the data is available in the cache. Of course, yes, the DAC cycle, it's going to give us a lot of advantage while doing the processing. But the in-memory computing processing, that's going to give us lots of leverage. The next question lists some use cases where Spark outperforms Hadoop in processing. The first thing is the real-time processing. Hadoop cannot handle real-time processing, but Spark can handle real-time processing. So any data that's coming in, in the Lambda architecture, you will have three layers. And most of the big data projects will be in the Lambda architecture. You will have speed layer, batch layer, and service layer. And the speed layer, whenever the data comes in, that needs to be processed, stored, and handled. So in those type of real-time processing, Spark is the best fit. Of course, within Hadoop ecosystem, we have other components which does the real-time processing like Storm. But when you want to leverage the machine learning along with the Spark streaming on such computation, Spark will be much better. So that's why like when you have architecture like a Lambda architecture, you want to have all three layers, patch layer, speed layer, and service layer. Spark can gel the speed layer and service layer far better. And it's going to provide a better performance. And whenever you do the batch processing, especially like doing a machine learning processing, we will leverage the iterative computing and can perform 100 times faster than Hadoop. The more the iterative processing that we do, the more data will be read from the memory and it's going to get us a much faster performance than Hadoop MapReduce. So again, remember, whenever you do the processing only once, so you're going to do the processing only once, read, process it, and deliver the result. Spark may not be the best fit. That can be done with the MapReduce itself. And there is another component called Akka. It's a messaging system or message coordinating system. Spark internally uses Akka for scheduling or any task that needs to be assigned by the master to the worker and the follow up of that particular task by the master. Basically asynchronous coordination system and that's achieved using Akka. Akka programming internally it's used by the Spark. As such for the developers we don't need to worry about Akka programming. Of course we can leverage it but Akka is used internally by the Spark for scheduling and coordination between master and the worker. And within Spark, we have a few major components. Let's see what are the major components of Apache Spark. The name the components of Spark ecosystem. Spark comes with a core engine. So that has the core functionalities of what is required from by the Spark or for the Spark. RDDs are the building blocks of the Spark core engine. On top of Spark core, the basic functionalities of file interaction, file system, coordination, all that's done by the Spark Core Engine. On top of Spark Core Engine, we have n number of other offerings to do machine learning, to do graph computing, to do streaming. We have n number of other components. So the majorly used components are these components like Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, MLlib, GraphX, and Spark R. At the high level, we will see what are all these components. Spark SQL, especially it's designed to do the processing against a structured data. So we can write SQL queries and we can handle or we can do the processing. So it's going to give us the interface to interact with the data, especially structured data. And uh, the language that we can use, it's more similar to what we use within the SQL. I can say 99% is the same. And most of the commonly used functionalities within the SQL have been implemented within Spark SQL. And Spark Streaming is going to support the stream processing, that's the offering available to handle the uh, stream processing. And MLlib is the offering to handle machine learning. So the component name is called MLlib and it has a list of components, a list of machine learning algorithms already defined. We can leverage and use any of those machine learning algorithms. GraphX, again, it's a graph processing 
offerings within the Spark. It's going to support us to achieve graph computing against the data that we have, like page rank calculation, how many connected entities, how many triangles, all those going to provide us a meaning to that particular data. And Spark R is the component that's going to interact or help us to leverage the language R within the Spark environment. R is a statistical programming language where we can do statistical computing within the Spark environment and we can leverage R language by using the Spark R to get that executed within the Spark environment. Additional to that, there are other components as well, like approximate database, it's called BlinkDB, all other things like in beta stage. So these are the majorly used components within Spark. So next question, how can Spark be used alongside Hadoop? So when we say Spark performs much better, it's not a replacement to Hadoop. It's going to coexist with the Hadoop. So it's uh, leveraging the Spark and Hadoop together. It's going to help us to achieve the best result. Yes, Spark can do in-memory computing or can handle the speed layer. And Hadoop comes with the resource manager. So we can leverage the resource manager of Hadoop to make Spark to work. And few processing, we don't need to leverage the in-memory computing. For example, one-time processing, do the processing and forget, or just store it. We can use MapReduce. So the processing cost, or computing cost will be much less compared to Spark. So we can amalgamize and get, strike the right balance between the batch processing and stream processing when we have Spark along with Hadoop. So let's have some detailed question related to Spark Core. Within Spark Core, as I mentioned earlier, the core building block of Spark Core is RDD. Resilient Distributed Data Set. It's a virtual, it's not a physical entity, it's a logical entity. You will not see this RDDs existing. The existence of RDD will come into picture when you take some action. So this RDD will be used or referred to create the DAG cycle and RDDs will be optimized to transform from one form to another form, to make a plan how the data set needs to be transformed from one structure to another structure. And finally, when you take some against an RDD, the existence of the data structure, the resultant data will come into picture and that can be stored in any file system, either HDFS, S3 or any other file system can be stored. And RDDs can exist in a partitioned form, in the sense it can get distributed across multiple systems and it's fault tolerant. When I say fault tolerant, if any of the RDD is lost, any partition of the RDD is lost, it can regenerate only that specific partition it can regenerate. So that's the huge advantage of RDD. So if someone asks like what's the huge advantage of RDD, it's a fault tolerant where it can regenerate the last RDDs and it can exist in a distributed fashion and it is immutable. So since once the RDD is defined or like created, it cannot be changed. The next question is how do we create RDDs in Spark? There are two ways we can create the RDDs. One is using the Spark context. We can use any of the collections that's available within the Scala or in the Java and using the parallelize function we can create the RDD and it's going to use the underlying file systems distribution mechanism. If the data is located in a distributed file system like HDFS, it will leverage that and it will make those RDDs available in a number of systems. So it's going to leverage and follow the same distribution in RDD as well. Or we can create the RDD by loading the data from external sources as well like HPs. Generally HDFS we may not consider as an external source, it will be considered as a file system of Hadoop. So when Spark is working with Hadoop, mostly the file system we will be using will be the HDFS. So we can read from HPs or even we can read from other sources like Parquet file or from S3, different sources, Avro, we can read and create the RDD. Okay. Next question is what is executor memory in Spark application? So every Spark application will have a fixed heap size and fixed number of cores for the Spark executor. Executor is nothing but the execution unit available in every machine and that's going to facilitate to do the processing, to do the task in the worker machine. So irrespective of whether you use Yarn, Resource Manager or any other Mesos like Resource Manager, every worker machine we will have one executor and within the executor the task will be handled and uh, the memory to be allocated for that particular executor is what we define as the heap size and we can define how much amount of memory should be used for that particular executor within the worker machine as well as number of cores can be used within the executor or by the executor within the Spark application. 
and that can be controlled through the configuration files of Spark. Next question is define partitions in Apache Spark. So any data, irrespective of whether it is a small data or larger data, we can divide those data sets across multiple systems. The process of dividing the data into multiple pieces and making it to store across multiple systems as a different logical units is called partitioning. So in simple terms, partitioning is nothing but the process of dividing the data and storing in multiple systems is called partitions. And by default, the conversion of the data into RTD will happen in the system where the partition is existing. So the more the partition, the more parallelism we are going to get. At the same time, we have to be careful not to trigger huge amount of network data transfer as well. And every RTD can be partitioned within Spark. And uh, the parallel, the partitioning going to help us to achieve parallelism. More the partition that we have, more distributions can be done. And uh, the key thing about the success of the Spark program is minimizing the network traffic while doing the parallel processing and minimizing the data transfer within the systems of Spark. What operations does RDD support? So I can operate multiple operations against the RDD. So there are two type of things we can do. We can group it into two. One is transformations. In transformations, RDD will get transformed from one form to another form. Say like filtering, grouping, all that. It's like it's going to get transformed from one form to another form. One small example like reduce by key, filter, all that will be transformations. The resultant of the transformation will be another RDD. At the same time, we can take some actions against the RDD that's going to give us the final result. I can say count how many records are they or store that result into the HDFS. They all are actions. So multiple actions can be taken against the RDD. So the existence of the data will come into picture only if I take some action against the RDD. Okay, next question, what do you understand by transformations in Spark? So transformations are nothing but functions. Mostly it will be higher, higher order functions. Within Scala, we have something like a higher order functions, which will be applied against that RDD. Mostly against the list of elements that we have within the RDD, that function will get applied. But the existence of the RDD will come into picture only if we take some action against it. In this particular example, I'm reading the file and having it within the RDD called raw data. Then I'm doing some transformation using a map. So it's going to apply a function. So within map, I have some function which will split each record using the tab. So the split with the tab will be applied against each record within the raw data. And the resultant movies data will again be another RDD. But of course, this will be a lazy operation. The existence of movies data will come into picture only if I take some action against it, like count or print or store. Only those actions will generate the data. So next question, define functions of Spark core. So that's going to take care of the memory management and fault tolerance of RDDs. It's going to help us to schedule, distribute the task and manage the jobs running within the cluster. And so it's going to help us to uh, store the data in the storage system as well as read the data from the storage system. That's to do the file system level operations. It's going to help us. And Spark core programming can be done in any of these languages like Java, Scala, Python, as well as using R. So core is at the horizontal level. On top of Spark core, we can have a number of components. And there are different type of RDDs available. One such special type is pair RDD. So next question, what do you understand by pair RDD. So it's going to exist in pairs as a keys and values. So I can do some special functions within the pair RDDs or special transformations like collect all the values corresponding to the same key like sort and shuffle. What happens within the sort and shuffle of Hadoop? Those type of operations like you want to consolidate or group all the values corresponding to the same key or apply some functions against all the values corresponding to the same key. Like I want to get the sum of the value of all the keys. We can use the pair RDD and get that achieved. So it's going to, the data within the RDD going to exist in pairs, keys and values. All right, okay, uh, question from uh, Jason. What are uh, vector RDDs? In machine learning, you will have a huge amount of processing handled by vectors and matrices. And uh, we do lots of operations, vector operations like effective vector or transforming any data into a vector form. So vectors like as the normal way, it will have a direction and magnitude. 
So we can do some operations like sum two vectors and what is the difference between the vector A and B as well as A and C. If the difference between vector A and B is less compared to A and C, we can say the vector A and B is somewhat similar okay, in terms of features. So the vector RDD will be used to represent the vector directly and that will be used extensively while doing the machine learning. Yeah, Jason. Thank you. And there's another question, what is RDD lineage? So here, any data processing, any transformations that we do, it maintains something called a lineage. So how data is getting transformed? When the data is available in a partition form in multiple systems, and when we do the transformation, it will undergo multiple steps. And in the distributed world, it's very common to have failures of machines or uh, machines going out of the network. And the system or framework, as such, it should be in a position to handle. Spark handles it through RDD lineage. So it can restore the last partition only. Assume like out of 10 machines, data is distributed across five machines. Out of that, those five machines, one machine is lost. So whatever the latest transformation that had that data for that particular partition, the partition in the last machine alone can be regenerated. And it knows how to regenerate that data or how to get that resultant data using the concept of RDD lineage. So from which data source it got generated, what was its prior step, so the complete lineage will be available. And it's maintained by the Spark framework internally. We call that as RDD lineage. What is Spark driver? To put it simply for those who are from Hadoop background, Yarn background, we can compare this to AppMaster. Every application will have a Spark driver that will have a Spark context which is going to coordinate the complete execution of the job that will connect to the Spark master and uh, delivers the RDD graph, that is the lineage to the master and uh, coordinate the tasks, whatever the task that gets executed in the distributed environment. It can do the parallel processing, do the transformations and actions against the RDD. So it's a single point of contact for that specific application. So Spark driver is a short lived and the Spark context within the Spark driver is going to be the coordinator between the master and the tasks that are running. And Spark driver can get started in any of the executor within Spark. Okay. Name types of cluster managers in Spark. So whenever you have a group of machines, you need a manager to manage the resources. There are different type of cluster manager. Already we have seen the YARN, yet another resource negotiator, which manages the resources of Hadoop. On top of YARN, we can make Spark to work. Sometimes I may want to have Spark alone in my organization and not along with the Hadoop or any other technology, then I can go with the standalone. Spark has built-in cluster manager. So only Spark can get executed multiple systems. But generally, if we have a cluster, we will try to leverage various other computing platforms or computing frameworks like graph processing, giraffe, these, all that we will try to leverage. In that case, we will go with Yarn or some generalized resource manager like Mesos. Yarn is very specific to Hadoop and it comes along with Hadoop. Mesos is a cluster level resource manager. When I have multiple cl clusters within an organization, then I can use Mesos. Mesos is also a resource manager. It's a separate top level project within Apache. Next question, what do you understand by worker node? So in a cluster, in a distributed environment, we will have n number of workers. We call that as a worker node or a slave node, which does the actual processing going to get the data, do the processing and get us the result. And master node going to assign what task to be done by what worker node. And it's going to read the data available in the specific worker node. Generally the task assigned to the worker node or the task will be assigned to the worker node where data is located. In big data space, especially Hadoop, always it will try to achieve the data locality. That's what we call it as the uh, resource availability. As well as the availability of the resource in terms of CPU, memory as well will be considered. Assume I have some data in replicated in three machines. All three machines are busy doing the work and no CPU or memory available to start the other task. It will not wait for those machines to complete the job and get the resource and do the processing. It will start the processing in some other machine which is going to be near to that the machines having the data and read the data over the network. So to answer straight, worker machines are nothing but which does the actual work and going to report to the master in terms of what is the resource utilization and the tasks running within the work commissions will be doing the actual work. And what is a sparse vector? Just a few minutes back I was answering 
a question like what is a vector? Vector is nothing but representing the data in multidimensional form. A vector can be multidimensional vector as well. Assume I'm going to represent a point in space. I need three dimensions, x, y, and z. So the vector will have three dimensions. If I need to represent a line in the space, then I need two points to represent the starting point of the line and the end point of the line. Then I need a vector which can hold, so it will have two dimensions. The first dimension will have one point, the second dimension will have another point. At the same way, if I have to represent a plane, then I need another dimension to represent two lines. So each line will be representing two points. Same way I can represent any data using a vector form. Assume I have huge number of feedback or ratings of products across an organization. Let's take a simple example, Amazon. Amazon have millions of products. Not every user, not even a single user would have used millions of all the products within Amazon. So only hardly we would have used like a 0.1% or like even less than that. Maybe like few hundred products we would have used and rated the products within Amazon for the complete lifetime. If I have to represent all ratings of the products with a vector, I'll say the first position of the rating, it's going to refer to the product with ID 1. Second position, it's going to refer to the product with ID 2. So I'll have million values within that particular vector. Out of million values, I'll have only values for 100 products where I have provided the ratings. So it may vary from number 1 to 5. For all others, it will say 0. Sparse means thinly distributed. Yeah. So to represent the huge amount of data with the position and saying this particular position is having a 0 value, we can mention that with a key and value. So what position having what value? Rather than storing all zeros, I can store only non-zeros, the position of it and the corresponding value. That means all others going to be a zero value. So we can mention this particular sparse vector, mentioning it to represent the non-zero entities. So to store only the non-zero entities, the sparse vector will be used. So that we don't need to waste additional space while storing the sparse vector. Let's discuss some questions on Spark streaming. How is streaming implemented in Spark? I explain with examples. Spark streaming is used for processing real-time streaming data to precisely say it's a micro-batch processing. So data will be collected between every small interval, say maybe like 0.5 seconds or every seconds, and it will get processed. So internally it's going to create micro-batches. The data created out of that micro-batch we call that is a D-stream. D-stream is like a RDD. So I can do transformations or actions, whatever that I do with RDD, I can do it with DStream as well. And Spark Streaming can read data from Flume, HDFS, or other streaming sources as well, and store the data in the dashboard or in any other database. And it provides a very high throughput, as it can be processed with a number of different systems in a distributed fashion. Again, streaming, DStream will be partitioned internally, and it has the built-in feature of fault tolerance. Even if any data is lost, any transformed RDD is lost, it can regenerate those RDDs from the existing or from the source data. So DStream is going to be the building block of streaming and it has the fault tolerance mechanism what we have within the RDD. So DStream or specialized RDD, specialized form of RDD specifically to use it within the Spark streaming. Okay, next question, what is the significance of sliding window operation? That's a very interesting one. In the streaming data, whenever we do the computing, the data density or the business implications of that specific data may oscillate a lot. For example, within Twitter, we used to say the trending tweet hashtag. Just because that hashtag is very popular, maybe someone might have hacked into the system and used a number of tweets. Maybe for that particular hour, it might have appeared millions of times. Just because it appeared millions of times for that specific a minute duration or like say two, three minute duration, it should not get into the trending tag or trending hashtag for that particular day or for that particular month. So what we will do, we will try to do an average. So like a window, this current time frame and T minus one, T minus two, all the data we will consider and we will try to find the average or some. So the complete business logic will be applied against that particular window. So any drastic changes or to precisely say the spike or dip, any drastic spike or drastic dip in the pattern of the data 
will be normalized. So that's the biggest significance of using the sliding window operation within Spark Streaming. And Spark can handle this sliding window automatically. It can store the prior data, the T minus one, T minus two, and how big the window needs to be maintained. All that can be handled easily within the program handles at the abstract level. Next question is what is DStream? The expansion is discretized stream. So that's the abstract form or the virtual form of representation of the data for the Spark streaming. The same way how RDD getting transformed from one form to another form, we will have series of RDDs all put together called as a DStream. So DStream is nothing but it's another representation of RDD or like a group of RDDs. We call that as a DStream. And I can apply the streaming functions or any of the functions, transformations or actions are available within the streaming against this DStream. So within that particular micro batch, so I'll define what interval the data should be collected or should be processed. We call that as a micro batch. It could be every one second or every 100 milliseconds or every five seconds. I can define that page particular period. So all the data received in that particular duration will be considered as a piece of data and that will be called as a DStream. Next question, explain caching in Spark streaming. Of course, yes, Spark internally it uses in-memory computing. So any data when it is doing the computing that's getting generated, it will be there in memory. But further, if you do more and more processing with other jobs, when there is a need for more memory, the least used RDDs will be cleared off from the memory. Or the least used data available out of actions from the RDD will be cleared off from the memory. Sometimes I may need that data forever in memory. Very simple example like dictionary. I want the dictionary words should be always available in memory because I may do a spell check against the tweet commands or feedback commands a number of times. So what I can do, I can say cache those, any data that comes in, we can cache it or persist it in memory. So even when there is a need for memory by other applications, this specific data will not be removed. And especially that will be used to do the further processing and the caching also can be defined whether it should be in memory only or in memory and hard disk that also we can define it. Let's discuss some questions on Spark graphics. So next question is, is there an API for implementing graphs in Spark? So in graph theory, everything will be represented as a, a graph. When I say graph, it will have nodes and edges. So all will be represented using the RTDs. So it's going to extend the RDD and there is a component called graphics and it exposes the functionalities to represent a graph. We can have a edge RDD, vertex RDD. By creating the edges and vertex, I can create a graph. And this graph can exist in a distributed environment. So same way we will be in a position to do the panel processing as well. So graphics is just a form of representing the data, the graphs with edges and vertices. And of course, yes, it provides the API to implement or create the graph, do the processing on the graph, the APIs are provided. What is page rank in graphics? So within GraphX, once the graph is created, we can calculate the page rank for a particular node. So that's very similar to how we have the page rank for the websites within Google. The higher the page rank, that means it's more important within that particular graph. It's going to show the importance of that particular node or edge within that particular graph. When I say graph, it's a connected set of data. All data will be connected using the property and how much important that property makes. We will have a value associated to it. So within page rank, we can calculate like a static page rank. It will run a number of iterations. Or there is another page rank called dynamic page rank that will get executed till we reach a particular saturation level. And the saturation level can be defined with multiple criteria. And the APIs, we call that as a graph operations, can be directly executed against those graph and they all are available as API within the graphics. What is lineage graph? So the RDD is very similar to the graphics, how the graph representation, every RDD internally it will have the relation saying how that particular RDD got created and from where. How that got transformed. RDD is how they got transformed. So the complete lineage or the complete history or the complete path 
will be recorded within the lineage. That will be used in case if any particular partition of the RDD is lost, it can be regenerated. Even if the complete RDD is lost, we can regenerate. So it will have the complete information on what all partitions, where it is existing, what all transformations it had undergone, what is the resultant value. If anything is lost in the middle, it knows where to recalculate from and what all essential things need to be recalculated. It's going to save us a lot of time. And if that RDD is never being used, it will never get recalculated. So the recalculation also triggers based on the action. Only on need basis, it will recalculate. That's why it's going to use the memory optimally. Does Apache Spark provide checkpointing? Especially like take the example like a streaming. And uh, if any data is lost within that particular sliding window, we cannot get back the data or like the data will be lost. Assume I'm making a window of say 24 hours. To do some average, I'm making a sliding window of 24 hours. Every 24 hours, it'll keep on getting slided. And if you lose any system, assume there's a complete failure of the cluster, I may lose the data because it's all available in the memory. So how to recalculate if the data system is lost? It follows something called a checkpointing. So we can checkpoint the data and directly it's provided by the Spark API. We have to just provide the location where it should get checkpointed. And you can read that particular data back when you start the system again. Whatever the state it was in, we can regenerate that particular data. So yes, to answer the question straight, Apache Spark provides checkpointing and it will help us to regenerate the state what it was earlier. Let's move on to the next component, Spark MLlib. How is machine learning implemented in Spark? So machine learning, again, it's a very huge ocean by itself and it's not a technology specific to Spark. Machine learning is a common data science. It's a subset of data science world where we have different type of algorithms, different categories of algorithm like clustering, regression, dimensionality, reduction, all that we have. And all these algorithms or most of the algorithms have been implemented in Spark. And Spark is the preferred framework or preferred application component to do the machine learning algorithm nowadays or machine learning processing. The reason because most of the machine learning algorithms needs to be executed iteratively a number of times till we get the optimal result. Maybe like say 25 iterations or 50 iterations or till we get that specific accuracy. We will keep on running the processing again and again. And Spark is very good fit whenever you want to do the processing again and again. Because the data will be available in memory. I can read it faster. Store the data back into the memory. Again, read it faster. And all these machine learning algorithms have been provided within the Spark as a separate component called MLlib. And within MLlib, we have other components like featureization to extract the features. You may be wondering how we can process the images. The core thing about processing an image or audio or video is about extracting the feature and comparing the feature, how much they are related. So that's where vectors, matrices, all that will come into picture. And we can have pipeline of processing as well. Do the processing one, then take the result and do the processing two. And it has persistence algorithm as well. The result of it, the generated or processed result, it can be persisted and reloaded back into the system to continue the processing from that particular point onwards. Next question, what are categories of machine learning? Machine learning as such different categories are available, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforced learning. Supervised, unsupervised, it's very popular. Where we will know, so I'll give with an example. I'll know well in advance what category that belongs to. As if I want to do a character recognition. While training the data, I can give the information saying this particular image belongs to this particular category, character or this particular number and I can train. Sometimes I will not know well in advance. Assume like I may have um, different type of images like it may have cars, bikes, cat, dog, all that. I want to know how many category available. I will not know well in advance. So I want to group it. How many category available? And then I'll realize saying, okay, the, all this belongs to a particular category. I'll identify the pattern within that category and I'll give a category name. Say like all these images belongs to boat category or looks like a boat. So leaving it to the system by providing this value or not, that's where the different type of machine learning comes into picture. 
and as such machine learning is not specific to spark it's going to help us to achieve to run these machine learning algorithms what are spark ml lib tools ml lib is nothing but machine learning library or machine learning offering within the spark it has n number of algorithms implemented and it provides a very good feature to persist the result generally in machine learning we will generate a model the pattern of the data we call that as a model the model will be persisted either in uh, different forms like parquet avro different forms it can be stored or persisted and has methodologies to extract the features from a set of data i may have a million images i want to extract the common features available within those millions of images and there are other utilities available to process to define or like to define the seed the randomizing it so different utilities are available as well as pipelines that's very specific to spark where i can channel or arrange the sequence of steps to be undergone by the machine learning so machine learning one algorithm first and then the result of it will be fed into machine learning algorithm two like that we can have a sequence of execution and that will be defined using the pipelines these all are inbuilt features of spark ml lib what are some popular algorithms and utilities in spark ml lib so these are all some popular algorithms like regression classification basic statistics recommendation systems recommendation system is like well implemented all we have to provide is give the data if you give the ratings and products within an organization if you have the complete dump we can build the recommendation system in no time and if you give any user it can give a recommendation these are all the products the user may like and those products can be displayed in the search result recommendation system purely works on the basis of the feedback that we are providing for the earlier products that we had bought clustering dimensionality reduction whenever we do processing with a huge amount of data it's very very compute intensive and uh, we may have to reduce the dimensions especially the matrix dimensions within the ml lib without losing the features whatever the features are available without losing it we should reduce the dimensionality and there are some algorithms available to do that dimensionality reduction and feature extraction so what are all the common features or features available within that particular image and i can compare what are all the common across common features available within those images that's how we will group those images so get me whether this particular image the person looking like this image available in the database or not for example assume the organization or, or the police department crime department maintaining a list of persons committed crime and if they get a new photo when they do a search they may not have the exact photo bit by bit the photo might have been taken with a different background different lightings different locations different time so 100% the data will be different or bits and bytes will be different but look wise yes they are going to be same so i am going to search the photo looking similar to this particular photograph as the input i'll provide to achieve that we will be extracting the features in each of those photos we will extract the features and we will try to match the feature rather than the bits and bytes and optimization as well in terms of processing or doing the piping there are a number of algorithms to do the optimization let's move on to spark sql is there a module to implement sql in spark how does it work so directly not the sql may be very similar to hive whatever the structured data that we have we can read the data or extract the meaning out of the data using sql and it exposes the api and we can use those api to read the data or create data frames and spark sql has four major categories data source data frame data frame is like the representation of x and y data or like a excel data multi dimensional structure data in abstract form on top of data frame i can do the query and internally it has the interpreter and optimizer any query i fire that will get interpreted or optimized and will get executed using the sql services and get the data from the data frame or it can read the data from the data source and do the processing what is a parquet file it's a format of the file where the data in some structured form especially the result of the spark sql can be stored or returned in some persistence and the parquet again it is a open source from apache it's a data serialization technique where we can serialize the data using the parquet form and to precisely say it's a columnar storage 
it's going to consume less space it will use the keys and values and store the data and also it helps you to access a specific data from that packet form using the query so packet it's another open source format data serialization form to store the data or process the data as well as to retrieve the data list the functions of spark sql it can be used to load the varieties of structured data of course yes spark sql can work only with the structured data it can be used to load varieties of structured data and you can use a sql like statements to query against the program and it can be used with the external tools to connect to the spark as well it gives a very good integration with the sql and using python java or scala code we can create a rdd from the structured data available directly using the spark sql i can generate the rdd so it's going to facilitate the people from database background to make the program faster and quicker next question is what do you understand by lazy evaluation so whenever you do any operation within the spark world it will not do the processing immediately it will look for the final result that we are asking for it if it doesn't ask for the final result it doesn't need to do the processing so based on the final action till we do the action there will not be any transformations or there will not be any actual processing happening it will just understand what are transformations it has to do finally if you ask for the action then in optimized way it's going to complete the data processing and get us the final result so to answer straight lazy evaluation is doing the processing only on need of the resultant data if the data is not required it's not going to do the processing can you use spark to access and analyze data stored in cassandra database yes it is possible okay not only cassandra any of the nosql database it can very well do the processing and the cassandra also works in a distributed architecture it's a nosql database so it can leverage the data locality the query can be executed locally where the cassandra nodes are available that's going to make the query execution faster and reduce the network load and spark executors it will try to get started or the spark executors in the machine where the cassandra nodes are available or data is available it's going to do the processing locally so it's going to leverage the data locality next question how can you minimize data transfers when working with spark if you ask the core design the success of the spark program depends on how much you are reducing the network transfer because network transfer is very costly operation and you cannot parallelize it gives multiple ways or especially two ways to avoid this one is called broadcast variable and accumulators broadcast variable it will help us to transfer any static data or any informations keep on publishing it to multiple systems so i'll say if any data to be transferred to multiple executors to be used in common i can broadcast it or i might want to consolidate the values happening in multiple workers in a single centralized location i can use accumulator so this will help us to achieve the data consolidation or data distribution in the distributed world at the api level or at the abstract level where we don't need to do the heavy lifting that's taken care by the spark for us what are broadcast variables just now as we discussed the value the common value that we need i may want that to be available in multiple ex executors multiple workers simple example you want to do a spell check on the tweet comments the dictionary which has the right list of words i'll have the complete list i want that particular dictionary to be available in each executor so that with the task with that's running locally in those executors can refer to that particular map task and get the processing done by avoiding the network data transfer so the process of distributing the data from the spark context to the executors where the task going to run is achieved using broadcast variables and so built in within the spark api using the spark api we can create the broadcast variable and the process of distributing this data available in all executors is taken care by the spark framework explain accumulators in spark the similar way how we have a broadcast variables we have accumulators as well simple example you want to count how many error records are available in the distributed environment assume data is distributed across multiple systems multiple executors each executor will do the processing count the records and atomically i may want the total count so what i'll do i'll ask to maintain an accumulator of course it will be maintained in this spark context in the driver program 
because the driver program going to be one per application. It will keep on getting accumulated and whenever I want I can read those values and take any appropriate action. So it's like more or less the accumulators and broadcast variables looks opposite to each other but the purpose is totally different. Why is there a need for broadcast variable when working with Apache Spark? It's a read-only variable and it will be cached in memory in a distributed fashion and it eliminates the work of moving the data from a centralized location that is a Spark driver or from a particular program to all the executors within the cluster where the task is going to get executed. We don't need to worry about where the task will get executed within the cluster. So when compared with uh, the accumulators, broadcast variables, it's going to have a read-only operation. The executors cannot change the value. It can only read those values. It cannot update. So mostly it will be used like a cache that we have for the RDD. Next question, how can you trigger automatic cleanups in Spark to handle accumulated metadata? So there is a, a parameter that we can set, TTL, that will get triggered along with the running jobs and uh, intermediately it's going to write the data result into the disk or clean the unnecessary data or clean the RDDs that's not being used. The least used RDD, it will get cleaned and it will keep the metadata as well as the memory clean. What are the various levels of persistence in Apache Spark? When we say data should be stored in memory, it can be in different level, it can be persistent. So it can be in memory only or memory and disk or disk only. And when it is getting stored, we can ask it to store it in a serialized form. So the reason why we may store our persist is, I want this particular RDD, this form of RDD later back for reusing. So I can read it back. Maybe I may not need it very immediately. So I don't want that to keep occupying my memory. I'll write it to the disk and I'll read it back whenever there is a need. I'll read it back. The next question, what do you understand by schema RDD? So schema RDD will be used especially within the Spark SQL. So the RDD will have the meta information built into it. It will have the schema also. Very similar to what we have the database schema, the structure of that particular data. And when I have the structure, it will be easy for me to handle the data. So data and the structure will be existing together. And the schema RDD now it's called as a data frame within Spark. And data frame term is very popular in languages like R, SAS, other languages it's very popular. So it's going to have the data and the meta information about that data saying what column, what structure it is in. Explain the scenario where you will be using Spark streaming. Assume you want to do a sentiment analysis of tweeters. So data will be streamed. So we will use a Flume sort of a tool to harvest the information from Twitter and feed it into Spark Streaming. It will extract or identify the sentiment of each and every tweet and mark it whether it is positive or negative. And accordingly, the data will be the structured data, the tweet ID, whether it is positive or negative, maybe percentage of positive and percentage of negative sentiment. Store it in some structured form. Then you can leverage the Spark SQL and do grouping or filtering based on the sentiment. And maybe I can use a machine learning algorithm. What drives that particular tweet to be in the negative side? Is there any similarity between all those negative sentiment, negative tweets? Maybe it's specific to a product or specific time by when the tweet was tweeted or from a specific region the tweet was tweeted. So those analysis could be done by leveraging the MLlib of Spark. So MLlib streaming core all going to work together. All these are like different offerings available to solve different problems. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you folks. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!